Welcome to the 28th meeting of the 2018 uh, ECCLR Committee. We have apologies from John Scott and welcome Morris Golden back to the committee as his substitute. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind anyone present to switch off their mobile phones. I'll just do that myself. Um, as uh, they may interfere with the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Climate Change Emissions Reduction Target Scotland Bill. This is the first of the committee's evidence sessions with stakeholders and we are delighted to be hearing from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Climate Exchange and the Committee on Climate Change this morning. These important contributions will provide an excellent foundation for our evidence sessions over the coming weeks and I'll say a little bit about them now. The committee intends to hear from witnesses in other countries who are setting emissions targets and responding to the commitments made in Paris. We will consider the behaviour changes required from individuals and communities in order to achieve targets proposed in the bill and we'll hear about the governance arrangements in place to support and motivate the public and private sectors. Turning our attention to specific sectors, we will hear from panels on agriculture and transport, two of the sectors in which the most progress is still to be made. Innovation and creativity will be an important part of developing the technologies required to achieve climate change targets, and we will be hearing from a panel on what is already happening in Scotland to progress this. We'll also consider the detail of the bill itself, with two panels of stakeholders representing those working in environmental and climate change fields, as well as representatives of different sectors. And finally, we'll conclude by hearing from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. The committee will consider its draft report in December and January and is anticipating publishing a report in January 2019. So we've got a very busy but fascinating few weeks ahead of us. Anyone who's interested in the committee's work in the bill can visit our website for details on our evidence sessions or contact the committee clerks. Although we hosted a call for views throughout the summer, if people wish to make further contributions ahead of specific evidence sessions, please contact the clerks and we will um, we'll let you know when these would be most usefully received. Can I, on behalf of the committee, thank everyone who took the time to send us submissions on the bill. We received over 90 of these and they will be invaluable to our scrutiny, so thank you very much. We also invited our Twitter followers to let us know what changes they would make to their lives in order to help achieve more challenging targets and receive lots of helpful insights. You can still join in and let us know what you would do, so please tweet us using the hashtag MyClimateChanges. Okay, so now we go to our first panel. We're joined in the room by Andy Kerr, who is the co-director of the Climate Exchange, and via video link from London, we have Jim Ski, the co-chair of the IPCC Working Group. Three. Welcome to you both. Good morning. So we're going to Good start. Morning. We're going to start with some questions, um, mainly uh, to Jim Ski. Uh, the first half of this session um, on the IPCC um, recently published special report on global warming, and I'll go first to Finlay Carson. Morning. Thank you. Um, the IPCC uses levels of confidence, for example, high, medium, and low. Um, when, you, when you're explaining evaluation of underlying evidence and, and argument. Can I ask, how does the IPCC uh, quantify levels of certainty and how certain are they in the science behind the predictions? Yeah, when, when we uh, uh, say that uh, something is there with high confidence, uh, we say that that is because there's a lot of literature that addresses the issue, and there's a high degree of agreement in the literature uh, about uh, the conclusions. And it is corresponding. We also use low level of confidence and medium level of confidence to reflect circumstances where the literature isn't so large or where there may be some differences of opinion there. So when we say something with high confidence, we really do mean that because there's a lot of literature out there. It's scientifically robust and there's, there's a lot of agreement. Also in that, uh, the IPCC refers to agreement uh, in relation to the level of confidence. Does that relate to scientific or political agreement? 
It relates entirely to scientific agreement. IPCC's job is to assess the, the scientific literature, and that's what we do. It is not a political body at the level at which we are putting together the underlying report. OK, thank you. And finally, the, the summary for policy makers states that global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees centigrade between 2030 and 2052. Uh, if it continues to increase at the current rate, does this mean that there's the sufficient, there's sufficient action prior to 2030 that could mitigate the rise to 1.5? Yeah, I mean, what that 2030 to 2052 uh, range is referring to is what happens if the world continues to warm at about a fifth of a degree a decade, uh, you, which is, is the centre of the range for, for current warming. If emissions were to be reduced from current levels, uh, the warming rate would be reduced, and that would mean that you could either limit warming to global uh, to 1.5 degrees or you could take that date at which uh, you reach 1.5 degrees further into the future. So action is possible. That is only if we, as it were, carry on warming as we are at the moment. That's very much a business-as-usual perspective on when we would hit the 1.5 threshold. Um, I'd like to follow up on asking about Chapter 3 of the report, because um, it's significant. It sets out the impacts of the 1.5 uh, degrees on natural human systems. Could you outline for us what the, sort of the headline impacts would be for the nor Northern Europe, the UK, and Scotland in particular? Um, the, I, I, I should, one thing I should just say to, to start this off, uh, before uh, IPCC started on this report, there was really no scientific literature targeted at 1.5 degrees warming. There was one, some that was relevant, but none was really targeted. So what we've really seen during the course of this report is new literature being produced uh, that is, is very much targeted on the 1.5 threshold. Now, just to say that we, the IPCC, in the time available, and given the need for science to produce, uh, you know, ev new evidence over a very short period of two years and get it into the literature, the report doesn't to, you know, the the level of depth of e even Northern Europe, never mind, uh, you know, the UK and Scotland, uh, because that is going to require a lot of follow-up work. What the report did do is to identify generic kind of trends uh, that, that would be relevant, and it also targeted in particular, particular hot spots around the world. And in Europe, that happens to be the Mediterranean region, which is at risk of desertification and drought to very, very significant degrees. But some of the generic conclusions apply to to Britain and to Scotland. For example, the level of sea level rise is robust because that's a global kind of phenomenon. Uh, there are also the uh, conclusions about more intense and greater frequency of extreme weather events, storms, that would be a robust kind of conclusion. And again, as, as uh, things warm up, you would expect to see you know, threats to species and uh, biodiversity as well. So these generic conclusions would apply to Scotland. But at this stage, with, given the level of detail at which the work was carried out and the very global focus of the work, it's not really possible to go down into, even into the depths of the report and produce robust conclusions that are very specific to you know, something, a, a country the size of Scotland with that degree of specificity geographically. So I'm sorry, we, we didn't answer that question. I think this is for a follow-up. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, I'll move on to Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you. I wonder if you could uh, reflect upon an overshoot scenario whereby by 2100 we reach levels below 1.5 uh, centigrade, but in the intervening period in mid uh, century, we, we overshoot. And what would be the implications for the planet in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, th this was something that, you know, there's a group of countries uh, that, that are engaged with IPCC that are very concerned 
with overshoot issues. And the challenge with overshoot is basically the issue that some climate impacts are irreversible. If you lose a species, uh, you can't get it. You can't get it back again. If you've lost coral reefs, you can't. You can't get it back again. So the question of irreversibility and overshoot is absolutely critical. Uh, you know, it's. Clear, quite clearly, getting to 2100 and overshooting 1.5 degrees is far worse, in a sense, than keeping below 1.5 out the 21st century. So what the report did, because many, many scenarios out there do overshoot, we divided them into two groups. There are limited overshoot scenarios that as go as high as 1.6 degrees warming during the 21st century and what we call high overshoot scenarios uh, that, that go to higher levels, you're somewhere between 1.6 and 2. So we have distinguished between these and it is a very robust conclusion that overshoot scenarios have worse outcomes than those with no or limited overshoot. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Right, um, I have a question for you on whether about, about our um, government's proposed bill. Um, and I suppose I want to ask you first about whether the targets set out in the, the Climate Change Bill Scotland represent an appropriate contribution to a 1.5 degrees scenario. Well, I... I... I know that you will be speaking to Lord Deepen, you know, Chair of the Committee on Climate Change later, which has uh, already got the invitation, uh, you, you know, from the Scottish Government, the UK Government and the Welsh Assembly Government to look at that question. What the IPCC report uh, came up with was the conclusion that carbon dioxide emissions specifically would need to reach net zero globally sometime between about 2040 and 2070, uh, given, the, uh, you know, given the uncertainties around climate, the possibility of different pathways being followed. So that is the kind of the global bracket, uh, you know, for, for net zero. And the report, uh, I think, in fact, the Paris Agreement does say that developed countries would be, should be aspiring to hit net zero before developing countries, for example. So on that basis, combining the Paris Agreement and the IPCC conclusions, you would be suggesting that a country such as Scotland would probably be aiming for something a little earlier than that 20 to 40 to 2070 bracket, if you were if you were making a you know a reasonable fair contribution to that that global aim of net zero so um more recently our cabinet secretary has said that we have got an aim for net zero when it becomes scientifically possible um and we're looking at sort of interim targets up to then do you think that's a, a, wise, a wise move given that you know the the drive for net zero at the moment, with science as it is, with innovation as it is, might not be possible, or should we, should we just make a target for net zero and the rest will follow? I mean, that, that seems to be the debate that's going on at the moment. Yeah, the, the question of feasibility of uh, targets like net zero was one that did vex us during the production of the IPCC report. And we deliberately did not try to answer that question in a yes or no kind of way. The different approach we did was that we identified six sets of conditions that would need to be fulfilled if net zero was going to be achieved. And the first one was whether, frankly, whether it was geophysically possible. And in that sense, we answered the question very unambiguously. It is geophysically possible to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And then we got, went on to consider other factors like technical and economic feasibility. And again, it is technically feasible to do it, but you would probably need to address the issue that there would be stranded assets. There would be in, you know, existing investments that would have to be written off early if you were going to reach that kind of level, which has economic implications. But our last set of conditions related to social acceptability and the right political conditions. And these are actually questions that I don't think the scientists can answer. That's up for the governments. If you look at the history of the report, I mean, the 1.5 degrees idea did not come from the scientists. 
It came from the governments at the time that the Paris Agreement was signed. And they, they then invited IPCC to answer the homework question, what are the impacts and what would need to be done to get there? And we have answered that question in a scientifically honest kind of way. But the question of the political feasibility is not really one that we can answer. That's kind of back to parliaments, back to governments again, to decide whether they're up to the very great challenges that the report has set out. OK, I've got a short supplementary from Stuart Stevenson before I go to Claudia Beamish. Um, I just wondered if uh, the IPCC considered the differential effects of the we, we we have carbon dioxide at the top of our list and then we've six further gases starting with methane um, the carbon dioxide naturally will disperse in 30 to 50 years but the other ones disperse very much more rapidly to what extent has the research uh, looked at the differential effects of the non-co2 gases uh, on uh, climate change yeah, it, it, it has actually considered that very fully. So carbon dioxide, in fact, stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. It's effectively, effectively permanent, and nitrous oxide is also a long-lived gas. But the scenarios that were covered in the IPCC report also covered the short-lived climate forces like like methane, for example, as you say. So if you go to the summary for policymakers, one of the figures shows the trajectories through the 21st century for gases other than carbon dioxide. And basically the message is that they would all have to go down, but none of them actually get to net zero, as is the case with carbon, carbon dioxide. Worthwhile also saying that, I mean, IPCC is now considering things beyond the six gases that are covered by the Kyoto Protocol. So we're on to black carbon, you know, for example, you know, basically suit emissions as well, which is now one of the forces that we're actually thinking. And it's worthwhile saying with the Paris Agreement, because it's bottom up, the pledges that countries have been made are actually going beyond the, key, the, you know, the, the, the Kyoto six gas bat, basket. And they're also starting to consider other ways of weighting the different greenhouse gases uh, as well. And that's very much an open scientific agenda as to how you weigh the different gases in scenarios in which there are very substantial reductions in emissions. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Um, could you please expand uh, somewhat on, although you've highlighted, of course, it's difficult to, to be specific about Scotland because it was a global report, but is it possible to expand on the comment of the um, report which warned for, of the need, and I quote, for rapid far-reaching change, uh, unquote, to stay within the Paris Agreement and that significant emissions, emissions reductions would be needed by 2030. Could you say something about that and how that might relate to Scotland, please? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the full phrase was rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented. And, you know, and these words were, were actually quite carefully chosen. I, I think the, the, the message is that the uh, scale of the changes that would be needed in the emission pathways that we've got really frankly, have no precedent in human history for the kind of rate of the emissions reductions and, in fact, the changes in social and technical systems that would be required. They really are extremely demanding. Now, one thing to flag up is that there are one or two areas in which the rate of change is not unprecedented. And that particular area is actually in electricity systems, where in the past we have seen investments in new electricity generating capacity that has taken place at the speed and the scale at which would be needed uh, you know, to actually make the changes. So, in fact, I mean, over the last decade or so, the changes we've seen, the uptake of renewable energy globally, is actually causes a lot of signs for, for, for hope. That's an optimistic sign, uh, because we've seen the costs following, we've seen deployment going up exponentially here you know, in Scotland as well as well as. So that's a sign. And that kind of progress that has been made in electricity systems and renewables would really need to be replicated in other sectors like transport, uh, built environment, heavy industry, etc. So there are signs of progress in some areas, but it is not far, far reaching enough at the moment.
Right, thank you. Um, that, that's very helpful. And you've highlighted the sets of conditions um, that were within the report. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, while I appreciate it, it's a scientific report, whether you are able to comment on, um, you've highlighted the stranded assets, but uh, to look at this more positively, would setting a net zero emissions by 2050 uh, within our bill um, quickly, rather than later on, send a clear message to investors and to um, those who develop our skills for the future and to, um, to, uh, to the whole broad spectrum of sectors um, about getting our act together? Yeah, I mean, just to say, since the report came out, I mean, there's been intense interest from governments and media, and we do feel that the report has actually changed the conversation a bit, regardless of optimism or pessimism about whether any specific target can be met. So in that sense, I think, I think there is evidence that setting ambitious targets does change the conversation in the way that the Paris Agreement itself you know, changed things globally. We saw the oil and global oil and gas industry so suddenly waking up to things. So in the sense of sending a strong signal, I think you know, a net zero target you know, would do the job. It would wake people up. But I think the other condition, it would probably be need to be backed up by more specific policies and measures that gave effect to that long-term ambition. Because one of the things that we've been very clear about in the report is the need for near-term action to leave open the option of keeping to 1.5 degrees warming. So if a long-term target is backed up by short-term ambition and a sense of urgency in terms of moving forward across all sectors, I think that could, that could be quite effective in, in terms of moving the agenda on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Mark Ruskell. Uh, and just in terms of that near-term action, I mean, what are you looking for governments to do in terms of looking at their current action plans for the next 10 years and their interim targets? Um, I was in Iceland, for example, at the weekend, listening to the, um, the Icelandic Prime Minister who was saying that on the back of your IPCC advice, they're now going to be looking again at their action plans to reach a net zero by 2040 target. Is that the kind of, the kind of action that you're looking for governments to do, to sort of look at what the near-term changes should be, or, or is setting a long-term target enough? Yeah, you know, well, I don't personally think uh, that setting a long-term target is enough or, or that it's enough to look at an action plan. I think it's looking at an action plan, reformulating it and implementing it is what would actually be needed to move yourselves forward. So, I mean, obviously, I know a bit, a bit about the Scottish situation. There's been great progress on renewable energy and the electricity side. But, you know, getting a movement on, on you know, electrification of transport, uh, changing transport patterns, uh, you know, upping the ante on energy efficiency and, you know, renewable, renewable heat are all the kind of things that would be needed in the short term to move yourself forward. But I think the important thing also about the net zero target, it, 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 you know, we've said that there are no scenarios out there that achieve net zero globally without some form of carbon dioxide renew, uh, removal. And I think, you know, Scotland would probably need to consider that as well if it's going, to, going towards net zero, uh, because there will always be some sectors in which there are residual carbon dioxide emissions, and you may need uh, just negative emissions in order to offset these more difficult sectors. You know, land management, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, uh, you know, keeping up the afforestation rates are all examples of things that would help take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So even if some of these things can't be done immediately because the technologies and the techniques aren't mature, then there's a real need for sort of R&D demonstration projects to set you in the right direction for the longer term so that you have the preparation for the more difficult things that may be needed to be done a few decades down the line. Yeah. Do, do you think then that the Scottish Government should be requesting the UK CCC to look at the 2032 target uh, and the actions that are required um, to meet that target in light of your report? 
Um, well, well, just to, just to say, I do recall the, the letter that uh, you, you know came came from the uh, ministers inviting the, the committee on climate change, which uh, excluded the uh, third, fourth, and fifth carbon budgets. And I think I mean, there may be legal niceties about that that I'm not qualified to you, you address. But I cannot see that, given the statement about urgent action uh, that is needed in order to keep the option of 1.5 degrees warming, that any Anybody doing a scientific consideration of what net zero in the middle of the century might imply cannot also think about these shorter term, more medium term targets and what kind of pathway you need to put yourself on to get there. Recalling that carbon dioxide emissions accumulate in the atmosphere, so everything you do now will buy you benefits further down the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just following up on that, um is, I mean, is there a cost saving? Talking, you mentioned about the economic impact of um, you know, the transition and the, the changes that would have to be made in order to reach the targets. But is there a cost saving to be made by acting more quickly and, and meeting these interim targets in the long term? Yeah, um, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, again, I mean, the, the, the kind of uh, models that IPCC assessed. Uh, do have are strongly techno-economic models that actually assess the value of acting now versus acting later and trade these off. So the kind of uh, pathways that the models came up with, within the centre of the range, a 45% reduction in global CO2 emissions by 2030 were based on least cost considerations. If you were to delay any more in the long term, the costs would be, would be higher. And that's a fairly clear message coming out of the models, that urgent, you know, immediate action is needed, and in the long term, that's the least cost way of doing it. Otherwise, you will incur greater costs further down the line. And the other thing to flag up about these models, they don't uh, actually include in them the benefits of early action in terms of avoided impacts. They are purely models that look at uh, carbon dioxide pathways and the least cost way of getting to a pathway. They don't include the avoided impacts element, which would also be very important to think about in the wider sense. Could you give me an example of, of, of one particular scenario where, where there would be a huge cost implication um, if you didn't act? I mean, just, just for the benefit of, of, of people watching this committee, would you be able to give me an example that illustrates what well, you just one, said? Well, one, one thing that we, we have really highlighted quite strongly and drawn up to the summary for policymakers is, is that there is more than one way of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees. And basically, the trade-off is between early action now in what you might call the more conventional areas, system changes in energy, transportation, buildings, and doing that now, versus postponing action and relying on carbon dioxide removal techniques in the second half of the 21st century. And there are so many unknowns about many of these carbon dioxide removal techniques that you could be looking at significant costs associated with these. And these may not be costs that are captured in a conventional kind of economic they may relate to issues like food security uh, globally, issues like biodiversity, uh, the health of ecosystems, are all the things that you may pay costs for if you don't take more immediate action. OK, thank you very much. We're going to move on um, to questions specifically uh, directed in the direction of Andy Kerr. Um, I know that Jim Ski may have to go at one point, um, so if, if, uh, if you do have to go at one point, your evidence has been given by Andy Kerr, then thank you very much for your contribution today. Um, right, we move on to questions from Alec Rowley. Morning, Andy. Um, could, I, could I begin by looking at international comparisons and, and ask you, how does Scotland's approach compare with other countries and where, where are we in terms of what we are achieving? So uh, Scotland has been at the leading edge in terms of setting these targets. I think if you look through the way in which other countries have tried to adopt targets over the last few years, they've all actually adopted or they've taken a wide range of approaches to adopting these targets. Um, 
because Scotland is not a party to the UNFCCC, you know, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it's not a member state under the EU, we haven't been using the frameworks that have existed within that. So what we're seeing is different countries taking different approaches and they're not directly comparable. Let me give you an example. You know, Sweden has set a net zero target for 2045. That looks great. But actually what they've said is they will only, only need to see 85% of that from domestic action. In other words, they're expecting 15% to come from flexible mechanisms where they're buying in credits or doing other things like that. Um, so in that comparison, that is very comparable to us perhaps saying an 85% target or an 80 or 90% target by 2050. So we have to be quite careful about trying to make direct comparisons with countries that are saying we will be carbon neutral or net zero by a particular date because actually they're using very different mechanisms which are not always directly comparable. Okay. And do you think that, that legislating, um, as, as we are doing, because I know that some countries have set targets, but they have not put into legislation, it's simply it's policy. Do you think that it's important that we do legislate in order to achieve those targets? Yes, I mean, I think we've seen um, a lot of what we, what we might call virtue signalling by different countries saying we intend to do this. I think what uh, distinguishes the UK and Scotland specifically is the very tight monitoring and evaluation framework set up through legislation and we're going to be hearing from the Committee on Climate Change shortly. So I think that we have a much more robust framework within which to operate than many countries and we know that a number of other countries are looking specifically at the UK, at Scotland, at this monitoring and evaluation framework because it is much more robust than the ones that they have in place at the moment. Do you think, I mean, sometimes I, I, I get the impression that climate change, if you take the general population climate change is something that happens over there someplace and it's not really anything to do with us and there's not much we can do about that. Is there, is there good, good examples, international examples, where we're actually engaging and involving the, the community, if you like, in, in, in trying to tackle these issues? A greater awareness is, is, is perhaps what's needed. We've seen some good examples in some countries, not necessarily at a countrywide level. We've seen some outstanding examples at sort of city, city-state, city-region levels where they've done this much more effective engagement. And I think it is worth saying, I mean, Jim talked about the change in narrative with the report. Um, I would argue that we're also currently seeing a change in narrative because until now, climate change has always been something that was an, uh, needed an additional cost. It was something that was, you know, you, it was, it was. If you wanted to be, do the right thing for climate change, it was going to cost you a bit. You're going to have to subsidise renewables. You're going to have to add a carbon tax. The focus has always been we need to, to pay more in order to deliver the benefits. I think one of the big things that we are seeing changing, and we're seeing it even in places in Scotland, is with the rapid changes in technology costs. Um, we are seeing opportunities where actually you can deliver cost savings and deliver social and economic co-benefits at the same time as hitting environmental targets. And I think that's the, the, the crucial change that we can see in terms of how we, do, how we deliver changes over the next 5, 10, 15 years. So let me give you an example. Um, you know, even, it, even in Scotland, if, I'm, if I put solar panels on a, on a building or in a, in a business here in Edinburgh, it's cheaper than delivering than buying grid electricity, yeah. and that's so. It, as long as it's behind the grid, I'm not trying to sell it into the grid. I'm using it my, for myself, self-generating. It's cheaper, and so I can get a financial return on that. So, if you start to tie in that with the introduction of electric vehicles, you start to tie in that with the reduction in healthcare costs from air pollution in cities. You start to tie that in with much improved energy efficiency in buildings. So, you reduce again social costs and health costs associated with poor quality buildings, you can start to see how you can build a very, very effective system where you're delivering local jobs, you're delivering a reduced cost base for the society, and you're hitting environmental targets. That is very different from the, the narrative that we've had over the last few years. So I just think we're, we're, we're just at the point where we can start to talk about some really interesting opportunities at cities, in towns, in, in, in villages across Scotland, UK, uh, across Europe, 
which are fundamentally different from the conversations we've had in the past. Yeah, so, so do you agree that government at every level, i.e. local government, has a particular role to play in, in that? And can I ask finally in terms of the international sanctions for the failure to meet emissions and reduction target, is there international sanctions and what are those? So within the Paris Agreement, I mean, that was very explicitly designed as a bottom-up agreement. So what people have put forward are NDCs, nationally determined contributions. These are essentially self-regulated by the countries. It, what we have got away from, because the Kyoto Protocol wasn't accepted by certain countries, um, was where you had, if you like, an overarching body that was, would check on and oversee those and then try and apply penalties if countries did not meet that. So what we've got is a bottom-up system, so we don't have a formal way of, um, if you like, what well, we can monitor, but we don't have a formal way then of saying, if you don't meet your target, we're then going to impose some sort of sanctions on you. Uh, no, we don't have that. Okay. Within Europe, we have a stronger system within the European uh, sharing framework for emissions. We have a stronger framework tied to the to the wider opportunities within uh, to the tied to the wider um, governance within Europe. But that's not the same as saying internationally. Okay, thanks. Mike Ruskell wanted to pick up. Some yeah, points. I, I just wanted to pick up briefly. Um, and you said that the Swedish government has this provision to use uh, up to 15 percent uh, to, to meet up to 15 percent of their emissions reductions through credits i did hear that the deputy swedish first minister had explicitly ruled out using credits in policy terms so although they have that backstop mechanism as indeed we do in our current legislation the policy intention is not to use that i just wondered if you'd, you'd heard that but also you, you said about virtue signaling i'm wondering to what extent government should be innovation signaling so actually by having a gap, we don't have a complete pathway to get to 2050, but we know that there are technological developments that can come and taking a much emission-based approach to bringing together uh, academia, uh, industry and others to try and meet the gap and to develop innovation. What you've seen around the world in terms of that, that kind of development? Because we're a bit in, in the same position as we were with trying to put someone on the moon. Yeah. We don't know entirely how to get there yet, but we've got some very good brains and people who can work out how to do it if, if they're given enough time and, and impetus and support by government. And I guess that's a question about political boldness in the sense that um, we can rely on what are very good energy system models, for example, about saying, well, what are the costs and benefits? As Jim flagged, we know technically we can do it. Um, the issue is far more around the social and economic costs and benefits that come with that. Um, if you look at examples, I mean, perhaps the best example, we don't even need to go abroad, is around the 100% renewable electricity target that Scotland set. If you remember back when we set the 20% target, and everyone, a lot of people said, 20% renewable electricity, that's going to be tough. Then it was up to 40, then it was up to 50, then it was up to 100. And at each point, people were saying, Ooh, I'm not sure that's technically possible. Um, the answer is, we're, you know, we, we may not hit it exactly in 2020, but we're going to be not far off. I think that whole notion of saying, if we make a bold statement and say, can we see if we can achieve it, then I think there's real value to, to that political target as long as it is backed up with some serious action uh, below the line. And that's the, that, I suppose, is this point about deliverability. We're going to see a very competitive space in target setting by countries in the next few years. And, and the question is, are we trying to compete in that space or are we trying to compete in that? Are we actually delivering real outcomes over the next five to ten years? Because the sort of infrastructure investments that we're going to be putting in in the next ten years are going to determine largely whether we're going to be able to hit long-term targets. You know, we've got some, some work going on um, here in Scotland, where you know there's, a, there's an example of a, a school that's just been finished in, in uh, just nearby, where the energy costs in that school, which were finished last year, are higher than the old school, which is 100 years old. You know? Now that's putting a carbon and a cost implication onto the city uh, for the next 25 years. So we cannot be building those sorts of buildings going forward. So what happens now really does affect what happens in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And I think that deliverability bit and making sure that those targets are set in practical outcomes and practical delivery in terms of transport infrastructure, building infrastructure um, over the next five, ten years are absolutely critical. More so, and that's more important than worrying too much about whether you've you know, done a net zero by 2045 or 2040 or 2050, personally.
Not mentioned there is, is one sector for whom it is a real challenge, and that's agriculture. And it's very important to Scotland's economy. I mean, what are your thoughts there? I mean, there might be people from agriculture watching us now, thinking, well, you know, the targets are all very well, but there needs to be some kind of, you know, justice around the transition here, and how, how are we going to manage that? Yeah, and if, I mean, if you look at the, the response that QMS gave to your committee, I mean, they were flagging that at the moment it's a very crude way of saying if you reduce emissions, we, you know, what we're basically saying is we want less livestock, we want less. Um, arable, we want, you know, clearly what we're not trying to do is say we want to get rid of all our arable or livestock farmers. What we are saying, actually, and if you go back to the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement talks about balancing emissions and removals in the second half of the century. And that's actually what we're talking about. We're not saying we want to get all agriculture to zero. What we're saying is we will need to balance, we need to make them as efficient as possible, but we then need to balance whatever emissions comes from that with uh, greenhouse gas removals, which could be strong afforestation. You know, it could be other things, biomass and carbon capture and storage. Um, but, but in other words, we're not trying to say we're trying to stop the sector having any economic value. We want that to continue, but we need to balance it with other outcomes. And clearly, agriculture, some of the chemical sector might be another one, um, are, are tricky ones to deal with in terms of being um, zero carbon but we're not trying to get everything to zero carbon, we're trying to get to net zero, which means that you can still have emissions as long as you've got removals that, that um, balance those off. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to just close off the agriculture one. Uh, what uh, Jim Ski pointed out, that uh, the nitrous oxides are the big thing, and they primarily come from agriculture and primarily from fertilizer production. Uh, and that methane, he was suggesting, is less important because it disperses quite rapidly. Is that your understanding as well, then? Um, I would defer to Jim on that one, quite right. honestly. Okay, well, um, let, <clears throat> let me move on to the subject of targets, then. Um, and you, talk, you used the phrase competitive space on targets uh, in one of your previous answers there. Um, we have uh, legislated targets in primary legislation for various decades, but we also, of course, through secondary legislation, are setting targets for each year on a rolling program of doing that. How does that compare with the approach of other countries? So, um, again, what we see internationally is a complete variety. Some have set fixed single-point targets without a, a glide path towards those targets. Others have talked about budgets, which is, of course, where we're coming from. The, the key thing from a scientific perspective is the area under the curve. It is the entire carbon budget. So rather than setting an individual um, year target and saying that's what we're aiming for, you know, all countries ought to be following what we have done, UK has done, which are setting carbon budgets, which are defined by annual or five-year targets on a glide path towards a particular target. So different countries have taken slightly different approaches. Um, a lot of them, as I said, have, have, have come up with very different approaches. Some are not including international aviation, some are not including shipping, others are including land use, others are not including land use. So we're seeing all sorts of different targets being set by different countries or by different states, which is why the, the comparison is so, so difficult. But I think from our perspective, we need to be clear of what the, the science is telling us, which is that you need to have those budgets and you need to have those, the clarity of the glide path to demonstrate what we are doing. So, so, in a sense, uh, with the UK having five-year uh, targets and Scotland having annual, it really, there is no practical difference between those two approaches that need to concern us one way or the other. I think the, my experience is that the annual targets have forced this issue to be addressed in Parliament every year in a way that has not happened to the same degree in the UK Parliament. So I think there's actually been political benefit of having this issue at the forefront of that conversation because they are annual targets, even if it makes little difference in, in the overall sense. I think from a political perspective, it's been more useful to have that. But clearly, we are very dependent on, you know, if we have a cold winter, our emissions are going to go up. As you know, we've had changes in the baseline because of land use, um, changes in the way in which we measure and account for land use. 
So we've, we've seen the baseline jumping around, so it does make annual targets difficult, but I think from a political perspective, the benefit of the annual targets has been that the Minister has to come to Parliament and explain where we are as a country. And I think that's more useful on, a, on an annual basis than on a five-yearly basis. So, so therefore, the science being available and reported uh, to Parliament on a frequent basis helps drive the political decision makers and hence investment in dealing with the problem? Yes, as long as you have the virtuous circle coming back to action. And I come back to that deliverability. You know, we, we, you know, we have a lot of, we have the public bodies reporting climate change. The danger we've seen with some of the public bodies is that it simply becomes a tick box that you report, but you then don't bring that sort of virtuous circle back to, okay, so what are we going to do as an organisation to actually then drive forward further change? And, and that, to me, is, a, is the challenge. It's not just do we report well, but how do we then make sure that comes back to delivering outcomes? So just finally in my segment here then, are you suggesting that uh, one of the things that we need to address in Scotland therefore is, is setting targets down at individual body level? Because they're reporting but not acting is what you're suggesting. The work that we do with public bodies um, suggest that they already have a plethora of targets. The issue is not having another target. The issue is turning that into positive action. And that's different from having yet another target. That is about saying, how do we deliver effective outcomes? So if you take a, a city authority, you know, at the moment, sustainability reporting is, is tucked down. Somebody's given the, the ta task of, of reporting through the Scottish Government portal for, as a public body. Um, the question you need to ask is, does that report get read by the chief executive and the senior management team? Does it get read by the councillors? Are they actually then saying, what are the opportunities going forward as a result of that report? Uh, and the answer is, no, it's not happening, bluntly. Um, it's, it's a tick box at the bottom of a, of, a, of a pile. So the issue is not, can we set a new target for, for the thing? It is actually, how do we get how do we start to deliver action? And this comes back to my earlier point that we are now starting to see um, with efforts around placemaking, with efforts around trying to see how we as a city can start, or cities um, or city regions can start to look at mobility, we can start to tie in uh, buildings, healthcare and so on. So bringing that whole place-based opportunity and looking where the opportunities are, you can start to hit some of these bigger targets, but it's around, based around what we want as a city or what we want as a town or as a region, not by a, a Scottish Government target for climate change. Time for very short supplementary questions from Claudia Beamish and then from Finlay Carson right, before we uh, move on. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to push that a little further, uh, as you'll know, there are now the mandatory targets for public bodies on um, climate change duties. Is, do you see any place for there being um, the possibility of details being uh, developed within those mandatory targets for action that will follow? And I do appreciate it's a balance because you've highlighted pl placemaking and the, and the need to involve our communities across Scotland, rural and urban in this issue. But do you see an opportunity to, for there to be an expectation that if things aren't being met, how are they going to be met and then reporting on that? Yes, I think, um, I think we actually have a lot of the tools. They're not just being used particularly well at the moment. And I think, again, this is partly because I think the point earlier on, climate change is seen to be over here or it's something that will happen sometime in the future, rather than saying, actually, if you deliver the outcomes that we seek, you know, effective mobility systems with electric vehicles coming in, warm, home, warm affordable homes, um, reducing energy costs and so on, actually you hit a whole bunch of the core uh, targets that local authorities, for example, other public bodies are seeking to deliver. And you will do it in a way that actually, as a co-benefit, hits all the climate targets. So I think while we try and keep these completely in parallel, it's a real challenge. I think you've got to bring them together. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to have to move on to uh, uh, Richard Lyle. Yeah, thank you, Kandina. Um, there are numerous countries that are now taking action in climate change, so can I ask you, how does Scotland's emission accounting framework and the bills proposed changes compare with those international examples? 
Ah, okay. Um, much of what Scotland is trying to achieve with its it, the changes within the bill, um, from my perspective, makes sense in the sense that they're trying to simplify um, the reporting of emissions. So just to give you one example, most uh, countries within, who are within Europe are going to be reporting, and their re reporting is going to be including European Emissions Trading Scheme credits and debits. Um, this bill is basically saying, okay, we know that you know, going forward, notwithstanding um, the B word, um, we are part, you know, we're part of the European Emissions Trading Scheme, but actually for clarity, we're going to remove that, the way in which we report it to make it clearer that what we're reporting are national emissions from our uh, land area rather than saying we're going to include the, the debits and credits from, from, uh, from, from European Emissions Trading Scheme um, trading. You know, if you look at other countries like Sweden or, or uh, Finland or Norway, they will be including European Trading Scheme credits and debits in their accounting. So we have chosen to go down a route which provides more clarity in terms of the discussion we can have internally with the citizens of this country. But it does mean that we are, you know, it is not quite the same framework as is being used, for example, in other countries across Europe, because they will be using the EU ETS framework. Yeah, there are um, a number of countries who have set statutory sectoral, sectoral targets uh, for transport, energy, uh, um, and agriculture. How, how do you feel about that? So. Um, Generally, when you've seen other countries setting sector targets, a lot of them um, have focused on how do we support a particular sector to deliver an outcome, rather as we did with renewable electricity. So we set a very um, high renewable electricity target, which we're on the way to delivering. Some countries have been setting EV targets, so more electric vehicles. Others have been setting, um, as you said, uh, sectoral ones for agriculture and so on. Um, each of those tends to be set in a way that supports their particular political conversation of the time, shall we say. So they're trying to use this as a way of having a conversation with their particular um, sector. So um, I can't speak about New Zealand, but if you look at, at uh, Norway, you know, they, or Ireland, for example, they actually have talked more widely, not just about sectors, but actually just delivering a low carbon economy by 2050. They haven't even actually put in a formal target in terms of emission reductions. Other countries have done different things. So it is very difficult to say that Scotland should do something because other countries are doing it. Um, different countries have chosen different approaches to this. Um, so that's not a very good answer, but it, th th there, are, there are things that we can do, particularly in terms of the intermediate targets around energy efficiency and buildings, renewable heat, which can incentivize and provide clarity to investors, to public bodies about that direction of, tr of travel, um, which would be very useful. Uh, and we can certainly draw on some of the examples from, from other countries. Um, if you look at Norway with electric vehicles, you can look at, at, at other countries doing other things. Um, so I think where they provide a very clear incentive structure to help that conversation internally, they have real value. Um, but overall, we're, we're, we're not worried so much about exactly where those sector emissions reductions come from. The issue is are we delivering them overall? out of time. We've got one final question from Angus MacDonald. Okay, um, thanks, Convener. If I could current, uh, turn to uh, carbon taxes and explore further a wee bit the uh, issue of um, ETS. Um, you've given us some examples already uh, in the previous question um, with regard to um, Norway uh, and Sweden. However, we know that, uh, for example, Denmark has imposed uh, carbon taxes since 1992 on fossil fuel industries and in France imposes a tax of 22 euros uh, per tonne of CO2 on, on certain industries. 
Um, we have also heard about Sweden, um, which expects to meet up to 15 per cent of its uh, commitments uh, that way, although it would, be get, it would be good to get some clarification on what the Deputy uh, Prime Minister in Sweden has uh, actually said. It would be good if we could get that from, from Spice. Um, now, we, we also know that uh, the UK will be excluded from participating in the uh, EU emissions trading scheme in, in the event of the looming um, no-deal scenario. So, in the event of a no-deal, should the UK develop a new comprehensive carbon taxation system uh, with an equivalent or greater burden than the current ETS? Uh, and if so, should it be based on energy consumption or greenhouse gas emissions? That's a big question. Um, so, if we were to <clears throat> crash out without a deal, um, we can still negotiate as a, you know, so if you look at Norway, not part of the European Union, but its, it's uh, factories and sites uh, are a part of the EU ETS. So we don't have to be a member of the European Union to be part of the EU ETS. If we come out of the EU, to, EU ETS, um, then f I suspect there will also be an issue around the trading of the materials, the products that we are producing in our country, and there will be the equivalent of a border tax anyway to sell these things into Europe, because they will not allow us to essentially produce product without a carbon tax, or the, 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 the carbon cost associated with the EU ETS, um, so that we're undercutting producers within Europe. So I think it's actually going to be tied much more to what the trade negotiation will be with Europe as to what is the most appropriate framework going forward that would both deliver the benefits that the current EU ETS does in terms of sharing, burden sharing around all of the different sites across Europe and finding the least cost producer um, of, of, uh, of, of carbon and therefore delivering the lowest cost way of reducing emissions. Um, so I think they're, they're, it's tied to the, to the, not just the withdrawal agreement, and if we come out without a no deal, it's actually tied to far more to what is the traded agreement that we end up with as to how we ought to frame our response in terms of uh, reg uh, regulation around the, the main industrial sites. Okay. I, we actually don't have much time. Very short question. Well, it was just um, to, to get your view on, on, on whether um, that the power to develop and set such a scheme uh, should be devolved or maintained at UK level? I mean, the benefit of the EU scheme was that it shared emission reduction effort across all member states. So if it was cheaper to reduce emissions in southern Germany or in Spain rather than Scotland, that's where you did it and you bought credit. So that actually produced an economic benefit to everyone. The danger of, of, of creating a smaller and smaller scheme is that you lose that ability to share the burden across multiple sites. So the cost will tend to go up. And if the costs go up, then it will not look as effective as tying in in some way to the existing scheme, which is why so many schemes want to try and tie to, to that existing scheme. So in that sense, the, the bigger the scheme from an from a economic um, perspective, the bigger the scheme, the more cost effective you are likely to find the emission reductions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Andy Kerr for giving the evidence today and uh, to Jim Ski, who is no longer with us in the, the video link. But thank you very much. We're going to suspend the session to allow a change of witnesses. Thank you.
So, welcome back. We continue taking evidence on the Climate Change Bill with our second panel this morning. I would like to welcome Lord Deben, Chair of the Committee on Climate Change. The Committee has a number of questions on the Scottish Government's Climate Change Plan, the 2018 Progress Report on Reducing Emissions in Scotland, and the advice the Committee on Climate Change provided to the Scottish Government on the Bill. So, welcome to Lord Deben. I will start off by asking you how compatible are the, fin the final Climate Change Plan in Scotland is with the Committee on Climate Change uh, scenarios and the Bill's proposal to move to a 90 per cent emissions reduction target? Well, we think that um, it is uh, uh, compatible. Uh, it's not our job to lay down the detailed arrangements by which you achieve ends, but in terms of the targets which you've set, they very much are in line with what we think is necessary. And one does have to say that Scotland uh, continues to be in advance of the rest of the United Kingdom in the way in which it's setting its targets. OK, thank you. So, g given that um, at present, if all the climate change plans and policy are fulfilled, Scotland will still miss the, two, the 2032 target by 5.7 per cent. Um, what more needs to be done to ensure the Scottish Government's projections and the, uh, the, the, uh, meet the target that they've set themselves? Well, I mean, it, th th this is a universal situation. Uh, you set a target, you set the mechanisms by which you're going to try to meet those targets, and then those mechanisms, when you do the adding up, don't quite fit in where it is. So it, it's perfectly possible to have a series of different ways of reaching those targets. There are two particular ones which seem to us to be really important. One is to uh, tighten up on the uh, transport emissions, which are clearly very important. And the other is in agriculture, which in the previous session you talked something about. Agriculture has a very considerable amount to, to offer, um, but it's no easier than any other, except indeed in the social terms, it can be even more difficult, particularly in the circumstance where we're to leave the European Union and having an entirely different kind of agricultural support system. Okay, and we'll move on to questions from Finlay Carson. It's just, just staying with agriculture, your, your most recent report suggested that uh, more could be done uh, to reduce emissions in transport and agriculture and that Scotland's progress had been somewhat masked by uh, the successes in the energy sector. Um, can I ask, um, you, you gave advice to the Scottish Government with regards to how uh, some targets or, or we, we could make better progress. Why do you think that the Scottish Government haven't adopted those recommendations? Well, I'm not sure um, I'm uh, uh, qualified to uh, investigate motives. So why, I don't think I can answer. But, but the fact is, uh, I do accept that some of the things that we have to do are enormously difficult, particularly at a time when we don't really know the terms within which we will be operating. And that is true in agriculture. Now, that means that we should concentrate on those things that we can do something about. So there's a series of things which one could do, even in this circumstances of, of, of total uh, chaos as far as uh, our relationships with our nearest neighbours. Um, and I would look to do that immediately, and I would be see, looking to see whether we can do something uh, along the lines of... Uh, uh, feeding animals differently, of uh, improving the way in which we uh, think about uh, precision farming and the use of uh, fertilisers. We can do a great deal more about um, uh, disease prevention. One of the things that we can do is to get better productivity without having more animals if we did a great deal more about uh, the eradication of certain endemic diseases. I mean, th there are a series of things of that kind which can be done, not because they will solve the problem, but because they are capable of being done without, out with the pr pr uh, parameters which are so uncertain. When we do have a better understanding, if that uh, <laughs> blessed day arrives at any near moment, when we do have a better understanding, then it seems to me that the, there is an urgency with dealing with uh, agriculture, simply because uh, coming from a, an agricultural background and interest, um, one is very aware of the social impacts of what you do. And uh, the whole issue of uh, what we do and how we do it 
uh, doesn't get any easier because we have to do it. And that seems to me, therefore, to demand a great deal more discussion. And if, if I were the, uh, if I were a Scots politician, I'd want to try to get a great deal more discussion about how we deal with, for example, improving our um, uh, tree planting, uh, actually giving some impetus to, to that and where it should be and really having a proper discussion of that. So there are a whole series of things I think we ought to get into the whole argument and I suppose if I'm disappointed and I'm disappointed uh, is that argument isn't going on. Even I, I prefer it to be a, a little sharper than the not existent and I don't think at the moment it, 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 it's, there's enough of it. Just, just on that and trying to achieve a better understanding, do you believe that there's enough funding uh, going into support for science and uh, research and development in that area. Um, and, and as a supplement to that, what areas do you think we should be prioritising when it comes to si soil ta testing or fertility or reducing mortality and animal diseases you've mentioned? Well, first of all, I don't think there's enough uh, uh, money going into the particular areas of... Uh, very great concern, which is one of which is my answer to the second half of your question, which I think soil fertility is actually the crucial issue because, uh, first of all, uh, it's uh, a matter of stewardship. The fact is we have allowed the, de the degradation of our soils over the past uh, uh, decades, which is very serious. And secondly, there is the issue of climate change itself, because unless we have fertile soils, the ability of the soil to sequestrate is very much reduced. So for those two reasons, I would put soil fertility at the work on that. And I suppose there's an additional one, which is that it is extremely difficult. Um, it does demand changes, may well demand changes of a sort we've not really thought through. I mean, a greater degree of mixed farming less monoculture. Well, what does that mean in terms of animal numbers? And does that mean that other animal, other areas of, uh, uh, of animal husbandry would have to reduce? Those are issues which have to be discussed. At the moment, I'm afraid we tend to say it all is very difficult, and I think uh, we don't want to discuss it. So I want to get the discussion on. And, and finally, um, given, given the, the, the little progress in agriculture, what impact do you think uh, the, the CCP scenarios will have on achieving 90%? Well, I, I, think, I think there's been a, a gathering of uh, pressures. There was no doubt that the amazing result of Paris the, was hugely important because it does one thing for us all, and that is that we know clearly the direction in which the whole world is moving. We know perfectly well that some people won't move as fast as they said they would, and other people do a bit better, and that we'll have real arguments about ratcheting, and that the, fish, the, the shipping industry won't do what they said, and then they'll have to be helped to do so. We know all that, but we know which direction we're in. Now, there are not many areas of, of life in which the direction is as clear as that. So I think a mixture of Paris the very, very clear warning of the IPCC report that has just been published and the detailed work which the CCC and the Scottish Government as well as the United Kingdom Government have done seem to me that at least this does put a kind of pressure on all these areas, not least agriculture, to get some speed. And the most important bit has been it has resulted in some baselines against which we can measure. Because previously I was very unhappy about giving any uh, comments about how successful we were because we didn't know what we were measuring it against. I think to a much greater degree we now do know that. Okay, thank you. And we have some supplementary questions on this theme from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Uh, just focusing on agriculture, the, the, what the Climate Change Committee has brought forward does imply that Scotland would be carbon neutral by 2050. But Scotland, of course, has the potential uh, because of huge as yet untapped tidal energy and so on and so forth uh, to be in electricity generation substantially better than carbon neutral. Is that an approach that could be pursued instead of, in particular, um, 
tackling the very difficult problem of uh, nitrous oxides that come from uh, agriculture? Or are there other broader reasons why we need to do the NO2 than simply making the numbers balance up? Well, the numbers argument is uh, a very difficult one because you need them if you're going to get people to do something that's real. And uh, the anecdotal mechanism for measuring things is no good at all. So numbers have really are vital. But I don't think numbers should hide the um, pluralistic situation which we really have. It isn't just about saying Scotland must get this balance right. It is also about what kind of future do you want and do you really want a future which um, puts up uh, with nitrous oxide to a degree which is actually unnecessary, which could be overcome, because you can make the numbers work out somewhere else. I'm not sure that, that is a, a worthy demand for Scotland. It seems to me that we're all going to have to find things we do better in order to make up for people who don't have the chance of doing it. And when you look at the ability of some countries in terms of their, their capability, their capacity to meet the targets which they are prepared to sign up to, then I do think that we and the richer countries have actually got to do more. And this is the kind of area where we should be doing more. We should be saying, yeah, we, there's a little bit of extra there which we contribute to the general good. And uh, I think the same is true in, in the rest of the United Kingdom. And one of my frustrations with what is being done in England is that we are not pushing hard enough to be able to have that margin. And that is a really serious issue. Right, Rothko. I think it's quite clear about the, the kind of actions and the kind of areas we need to be taking around agriculture and land use, but perhaps the sharper bit of the debate is around how we get there and is it a voluntary or a statutory approach to driving some of that action, particularly around soil health and soil testing. Do, do you see uh, ways in this bill that we could be sharpening up the ambition and the statutory backstop around agriculture and land use? Because at the moment we have an action plan that's very much based on voluntary you yeah. know, knowledge sharing and encouraging people to do things. Well, like most of life, it's not either or. I think it is both and. That's the, the first bit is that I, I don't think there is a, an all voluntary future. That, that seems to me. On the other hand, uh, you can't launch into statutory arrangements unless you've really sought to find the basis upon which that sta those statutory arrangements should be made. And the best way to do that is to try to work out as much as you can on a voluntary basis, recognising the urgency, which must mean that you move faster than you might, might want to. But I don't think it's easy to uh, be prescriptive before you've actually tried to see what it is that... Um, uh, you need to do. I remember when I was Minister of Agriculture um, being very questioning of uh, some prescriptive arrangements over one of the environmentally sensitive areas. I thought that the civil servants who were drawing it up had, um, uh, had, had thought they knew too much about this. And indeed, it was absolutely true. After two years, we discovered they got all the dates wrong. Um, and had we done it on a, uh, on a voluntary basis to start with, we would have found that the dates were different. It just needed uh, that sort of thing. Now, that was a very small thing, but it does seem to me that um, I, I don't despise the voluntary, but I do not believe that we will solve these problems unless we have a pretty tough statutory background against which people operate. And that's partly because this is tough, in any case, and partly because uh, there is no doubt that people will, that on a voluntary basis, there will be many who do not do their part, and that will mean that those who do do their part will feel that people are getting away with it, and that, in the end, will create a, an atmosphere and a relationship in agriculture which is not what any of us would want. Right, uh, Alec Rowley. Could I just maybe follow on from that? Because there is, there is a danger in Scotland that we uh, 
we pat ourselves on the back and say we're doing really great, but actually what we've done is looked at the, the picking the, the low line fruit, as it were. Uh, so the, the closure of Longanet Power Station uh, no doubt made a big contribution to, to the achievements to date. But in terms of agriculture, is there the data available that allows us to effectively estimate emissions from agriculture? And is there the knowledge available? Sometimes in this committee we've heard from, from farmers who say that the information, the support and the knowledge is not being made available to them in order to allow them to comply and start to take the necessary action. What would your view on that be? Um, I think four things. First, it is always true that the practitioners tend to believe that their immediate understanding is much better than the uh, way in which the government or the scientists put it. I, mean, I was fisheries minister for seven years, and you will understand um, fishermen are always aware of more fish in the sea than the scientists have managed to calculate, I'm afraid. So there is an issue there to start with. But the, th the second thing is that there's a truth there, too, because if you're doing it on the ground, you very often do understand things, which those who have never done it and who merely look at the science and the information uh, can uh, misunderstand it. So uh, there's a balance there for us to have. But the two other things. Uh, the first is that although, as I said, our uh, science is better than it was, our uh, baselines are more accurate than they were, they must all the time be improved, and there is a very great need to have cooperation from the doers, the farmers, to make sure that we get that ever more accurate and that we're prepared to admit when we've got it wrong and, 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 and improve it. That is not always easy. People don't like admitting that they're wrong, but we have to do that. But the, old, the other side is right, too. I do think that we've got to find better ways of informing farmers of all kinds uh, in a manner which is comprehensible. Uh, one of the most worrying things about British farming as a whole is the gap between the best farmers and the worst. It is an enormous difference. And we, if we can do something about that end of it, uh, then that makes a huge difference, because at this end, we're internationally comparable, not, in fact, at the top. We, it's funny how farmers in, this, in the United Kingdom as a whole always believe that they are more productive than their neighbours. The, the productivity figures aren't all that good. But the thing that's more worrying is the huge gap, and a, a, approaching that is going to be one of our biggest issues. So taking a an approach that is a sector approach, whether it's agriculture, transport, and, and do you think that needs to be accompanied by, I think the point was made earlier, that, that the bill we're looking at is very much about figures, numbers, targets, but actually what policy, do we need, we do, do we need more of a policy drive and does that need resources? So do we need to resource the sector such as farming and transport if we want to see significant reductions? Uh, indeed, if we want to meet the kind of targets that this bill is talking about? Well, we certainly need the resources to be able to interpret the targets in such a way as people can actually meet them. Um, and in such a way as there is a graduated effect route to them. I mean, I am very cynical about targets which are set for a date beyond the lifetime of the politicians who've set them, because uh, it's very easy to say in 2050 we're going to do X, Y, and Z, when uh, there won't be many of us here who are there to um, uh, take responsibility. So if that's the case, that's why the Climate Change Act is so good, because the concept of budgets and of having a cost-effective way of getting to those targets is crucial, because it means that you cannot put off to beyond your electoral cycle the things that have to be done. So uh, what I think is so important about the targets in, in, the, in the Act will be, will be a very careful consideration of the steps that you have to take to get to those targets. Because a target in 
2031 is only valuable if you know what you're doing in 2020 towards do it, de dealing with it, not just because it makes it credible, but for the reason that Jim Ski put forward, which is that the more we do now, the bigger the effect. The more we put off now, the more expensive and the less effective it is. So both reasons mean that you should be um, uploading this end of the, uh, uh, of the arrangements towards that, those targets. And having a clear trajectory is, to me, the most important thing, not just because I want to achieve the end, but also because it's only fair on the people who are trying to do it. If the farmer doesn't know what he ought to be doing now, but he's told where he has to get to in 2030, it seems to me that that's an unfair relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rep Ruskell. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to turn to the issue of the uh, request for advice um, that you've received from the UK government and the Scottish government and, and the Welsh government. Um, I mean, I noticed that in, in the letter, um, the, the letter said that um, you weren't being asked for, for advice in relation to the carbon budgets for 2018 to 2032. Um, and your own chief executive said that he was quite surprised that that was the case. Um, what, what's your interpretation then of what you have been asked to do on the back of the IPCC report? And what, what kind of reports will you be making over what time scale back to the devolved administrations and the UK government on the back of that? Well, the first thing is that the uh, powers which the Act give to the Climate Change Committee means that we could, for example, have decided to do this work without being asked if we thought that that was right. So it is in that sense uh, in our hands as to how we approach it. And indeed, we would certainly feel that our independent position is such that we would have to decide what would be best circumstances to give the best advice. That's the first thing. Not presaging anything. I'm merely saying that that's how we approach it. Um, it is perfectly uh, reasonable to say that the government had already received advice from the Climate Change Committee that there was no immediate need to change the targets for the fourth and fifth carbon budget because the trajectories which were envisaged gave you enough room as long as you moved towards the uh, if you like, the left-hand side of those trajectories, to be able to be online for what seemed to be what was necessary to, to, to meet a higher target. So it's, um, I think, not necessary to have much of a, an argument about it. You can be surprised about it, but you don't need, I think, that much an argument about it. What we shall seek to do um, is to achieve the real purpose, which is to say um, what do we have to do as a United Kingdom and with reference uh, to both Wales and Scotland who have asked in the same terms to have this, uh, what we have to do to meet the commitments we've made in Paris? That, that is what the question is and that's the question we're going to answer. Now, my own view is that it is likely that as long as you tighten the um, uh, approach to the fourth and fifth carbon budget so that you actually do better than the least you can do, it will find itself in the right direction to deliver what we need to do. But we won't see that until we, until we achieve. And of course, you can't actually do the work without going through those budgets. That isn't a, I mean, it's an obviously logical impossibility to do that. So you actually have to, have to think that through and you have to work out what result from carbon budget four and carbon budget five do, do you have to have in order to reach on beyond that? So you, you'd you have to do that. You'd have to make that assessment. Um, the question is, would it be outside those carbon budgets? Well, we've already suggested that it probably wouldn't be, but we're now revisiting it all, and we have, I think, probably by April to do that. It's a short period of time, but that's, that's what we shall do. And, and the letter specifically talked about... 
the UK carbon budgets. So it doesn't specifically relate to the budgets and the provisions within the Scottish Bill. So there does seem to be a lack of clarity here, and I'm wondering if you would perhaps would have preferred a letter from the Scottish Government saying, well, this is what we would like you to consider in the context of our legislation and, and the legislation that we're considering this committee. Well, well I think, uh, uh, Mr. Ruskell, I think what we will do is to take the view that we have to be as helpful as possible. And we do, after all, know what you have in your bill, and we do know what are the aspirations that Scotland has, and indeed I think you will have seen that we have been complimentary about what Scotland has been trying to do. So in the way in which we frame this, particularly because it is a joint uh, request from uh, uh, the nationalities, that um, we will seek to ensure that we give the indications which would be helpful to the Scottish Government in, 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 in thinking about how its bill should work out. So we're talking about April, I'm thinking about your timetable for the bill. I'm not sure this will be too far out to be able to make any alterations that you feel would be helpful. That, that advice will come in before we conclude this bill. Well, we, I mean, uh, the timetable that we at the moment are working to is one which would mean that we would advise in April next year. Okay. Rich, <coughs> Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, convener. The CCC, the Committee on Climate Change, which you're the, the chair of, um, can you give a, the committee a brief outline of the process of compiling the evidence in which your committee advice to ministers is based? Well, first of all, the committee itself consists, uh, apart from myself, of, of the most senior scientists uh, with interests in this field and economists, so that we start off with a, an expert committee. And this is very unusual because the other countries that have copied us have tended to have something less expert and more representative. So we seek, therefore, to... Uh, to uphold what we have been able to in the 10 years we have uh, existed, very specific scientific accuracy. So we then have a team um, of specially chosen uh, people who work in various aspects, team of some 30 people who work in-house. And then, obviously, when facing these issues, we have to decide those areas where we do not have in-house uh, uh, information when we need uh, greater uh, uh, material and we therefore go out and let contracts to major universities and research places uh, for them to compile answers that we need. We then bring that together and in a very detailed uh, system we create a report there's sort of two stages to it, really, because one of our members will be the champion for that area, will work through it very closely with the people who are writing it, and then we as a committee will go through it line by line, adding and taking away, being critical. And, uh, and my job is to try to make sure always that the report is, is accessible. Um, I do believe that one of the problems is that uh, scientific reports need to be accurate, but they also need to be uh, comprehensible to people who perhaps don't have more than the, uh, a smattering of uh, O-level science, and so, well, GCSE science. So we, I try very hard to, to carry through that responsibility and therefore uh, make sure that all of us can understand it. In regards to that, the, 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 you touched on it. Is the evidence in which the advice to ministers was based still relevant and when does it date from and has it uh, sub subsequently been superseded? Well we have a responsibility under the Act to keep very close to the development of scientific evidence. Um, that's why for example we encourage the government not to ask us to do this latest piece of work until we had had the full IPCC report because that was, has opened to us a whole body of uh, information which wasn't there. And I was very concerned that we shouldn't start on the work with the bits of information that had come out of the IPCC, because you never know 
how true those are. You must wait until you've got the full report. So we do believe that we have the very best evidence that is available. The people we go out to are those whom we recognise as being uh, on the forefront of, uh, uh, of the science. Um, and uh, were we to find some aspect which we had not covered, we would return to it. So I think we are, as, I mean, I think we are recognised internationally as, uh, as, as absolutely on the, uh, on the front uh, of where the science is. Given that the IPCC had recently published further evidence, given the imperatives outlined in the ICC, IPCC report, has the uh, Committee of Climate Change view changed on the advice given to the bill, uh, given to the bill? And I know of your long distinguished record in, in politics. I have long enough to remember your, uh, your actual name. Um, can, I, can I ask you, and this question has not been asked, and I have to ask it. The sceptics say that global average temperatures have already warmed over the centuries. And the sceptics also say that it's only the Earth adjusting itself. Why should we bother? Would you agree with me that we have to bother? and with your long distinguished career, that we must act now? Well, um, it'd be very much more convenient for us not to bother, and therefore the fact that one <laughs> is so passionate that we should bother is the result of, of actually understanding the science. And I have taken this view since the uh, 1980s, when I was one of the first to do so as Deputy Minister of Agriculture. And, uh, I remember having a discussion with the other person in the government who took that, which was Mrs Thatcher. And she said to me, well, if uh, you and I are the only two people who believe this, we're in a majority. Uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> which was a typical example of her attitude to these things. But she had come to it as a scientist, and I'd come to it as a non-scientist, but looking at the science. Because one of the things you learn, as you un I'm sure know, is that if you're working in a science-based industry like agriculture, you have to learn how you listen to scientists and how you apply that. You, you aren't a scientist yourself, but you have to understand how you question them, what you say, and how you make sure you're sure of it. And I was very clear by the, uh, that period in the mid-'80s um, that climate change was happening and that human beings were causing it. Um, uh, the, I say to the sceptics very simply, uh, and I'm sure you do the same, but I say to the sceptics very simply, if you go down into the ice for a million years, you cannot see a moment in which the, the uh, temperature has risen so far and so fast as it has in the last 200 years. And in those little globules, you can find how the carbon to us, written up. And if you want to tease them, it is always worth saying, if you remember that the earth was too hot for animals and for human beings, until gradually the carbon was pulled out of the atmosphere into trees and bushes, and that was laid down as oil and, ga uh, oil and gas and, 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 and coal. And what have we been doing over the last 200 years? We've been reversing the process. And frankly, if you reverse the process, you wouldn't be surprised, would you, if it reversed what happened? It seems to me that you've got to have a jolly good reason of explaining that it doesn't. And the last thing I'd say to them very simply is this. If I produce a new medicine on the, on the market and I say, I want you to have this new medicine, it's absolutely wonderful for cancer, uh, they'll say to you, well, prove that it's safe. I can't say, well, no, you prove it's safe. Not for me. This is a good medicine. You have to prove it's unsafe. That's not how nice works. And I've never understood why we don't actually stand up to the sceptics and say very simply, you prove that it is safe to do something we have never done before, which is to pour vast quantities of pollution into the atmosphere and pretend that it doesn't have any effect. Thank you very much. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Convener. I am, of course, merely a humble mathematician rather than perhaps a scientist with, with an arts degree, um, because it's a philosophy rather than anything else. Now, and I, and I want to just uh, return to uh, some, of the, some of the numbers. The Climate Change Committee is essentially uh, recommending 100% uh, 
uh, a zero carbon future for us, uh, but overall a 90% uh, reduction by 2050. And that we should uh, make provision for a 100% across the gases, but only legislate once the evidence base has been strengthened. Um, what does evidence base being strengthened actually mean when you say it? I'm a practical man, and I don't think you should set targets unless you have a very clear route to achieve those targets. And for me, this is the strength of the Climate Change Act in the sense that it has this very clear practicality and laying on our shoulders is what is the cost-effective way of reaching what is at the moment our statutory requirement, which is the 80% reduction by 2050. Um, until we've done the work that we are about to do, I cannot hand on heart say, we have looked at all this, this is the best way of achieving it, and we can achieve it, and this is a date by which we could achieve it. I could make a generalised suggestion, and some political parties have in fact done that. But it seems to me, as I said earlier, not very helpful, because it doesn't mean anything unless you have created a route to reach it which impinges upon you now because otherwise it is merely something which you leave to your successors. If you have a route, then you have to start doing things now. So even if what we have to do is to say that in the fourth carbon budget, we have to achieve at the top end of the requirement rather than lower down, that does mean that we operate in a different way and we are then committing ourselves to deliver that. But I can't, until I've done that work, say to you what that date should sensibly be, uh, nor the sensible route to reach it. So, turn, turning the thing on its head, is it, uh, is it therefore proper that we should be driving it by the need rather than the practicality? Well, uh, yes, the need is why we're driving it. Uh, we're doing it because if we don't do it, we will leave a uh, planet for our children which will be extremely unpleasant, maybe unlivable in. So yes, of course, we're driven by the need. And when people say, oh, it's all very difficult, why can't we spend more time doing it? I have to say to them, because climate change doesn't wait for you to make it convenient. That's absolutely true. So by saying the practicalities, it isn't that I um, think that uh, you measure what is practical in the sense of doing the things you think you can do and fix the dates like that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I need to show the practical means of reaching this at a point which is sufficiently soon to deliver what Paris has asked for. So yes, it's the need, and after all, Paris put this figure, this uh, below two degrees and as far down towards 1.5 as possible, put that figure as a political figure. It's for us now to make it a practicality. That doesn't mean to say we ignore the need. They have given us the need. They're right to have done that. I accept that. But we must put that in practical, in a, in a practical means without allowing the difficulty to drive us off, off course. So you're quite right to, to raise the two bits that you have to have in, in, in tension as you, as you seek to do this. Well, fin finally then, you use the word practical means. Um, is what's missing from our understanding of getting to net zero in 2050 a technology emission? In other words, we don't yet see that there are technologies that can be developed, that reasonably can be expected to be developed that will deliver it. Or is it a financial inhibition that means we can't yet see how we can afford to do it? Or is it a combination of both? Or is it something else entirely different? Well, I think it, from our point of view, it's primarily that we haven't done the work, that, that, that we have previously been, uh, by law, 
constrained to deliver 80% reduction by the year 2050. And that's what the law has said, and that's what, therefore, we have done. So our, the prime reason for not immediately saying that's the date and the rest of it is that we have actually not done it on that basis. The only bit of work that we have done was the work that we did immediately after Paris for the government of our own volition to say that if they kept to the budgets, um, within those budgets there was sufficient um, opportunity to keep on target for a significant reduction beyond the 80%. That's all we've done. Um, and so the first thing that stands in the way of it is we haven't done the work. And I, I, we have a reputation of, of being very effectively science-based in, in 10 years. It's our anniversary on the 26th of next month. Um, in 10 years, I think it's true, people have not been able to suggest that any of our work has been other than the very best science. So I've got to keep to that. Um, I suspect that there will be some real problems as far as um, technology is concerned because the government of the United Kingdom has been dilatory in dealing with carbon capture and storage. And carbon capture and storage is a crucial part, particularly for industry, to deliver what we need. Indeed, I don't think it's just a crucial part, it's a necessary part. If we can't do that, the alternatives are really very, very expensive and very, very difficult. And I think the government's now more or less caught on to it, but we've wasted a period of time which we should have been using for that purpose. Um, the other thing we've got to be very careful about is the um, George W. Bush technique, which is to say, well, it'll all be all right because we'll invent something. Well, it won't be all right in that sense. What we have to do is to set very demanding targets, because they are, not because we want them to be demanding, but very demanding targets, and then create the atmosphere in which people will bring forward the technology which enables us to... To, to do it more easily than we thought. And after all, that is what has happened. The offshore wind revolution has shown that we can deliver something at a price we never thought we could. We can clearly say, although I was attacked by the Daily Telegraph for saying it and BBC for upholding my saying it, it is now true that onshore wind is cheaper to produce electricity than, than, than all the old-fashioned ways. Um, and that's been genuinely a, a mixture of setting the targets and providing the means whereby technology can, in fact, achieve it. And that's what we must do. The things you've said there about um, onshore wind and carbon capture and storage, because those are two areas where funding's been taken away. The research funding was taken away from CCS, and that had an impact on Stuart Stevenson's constituency. Um, and also, of course, uh, the kind of subsidies for people actually investing in on onshore wind were taken away as well. So that's disincentivising. And you've pointed out, is there, am I sensing a change in mood towards these two technologies that they're going to be uh, given well, the funding they deserve? Well, uh, convener, it's not... Uh, it's not a change in mood from the Climate Change Committee because we have uh, consistently said we need CCS. We've consistently criticised the United Kingdom government for not continuing the work on that. It's not our job to say that this or that project should go ahead. Mm. It's our job to say we have to go ahead with sufficient projects to deliver what we need to deliver. Government is the democratically elected body to decide on the difference, but, mm -hmm. but what you can't do is to opt out of it. That's yeah. it. Now, on onshore wind, I have again repeated uh, uh, this fact, and very interestingly, I'm very interested how you, how you phrased that, because um, I see the BBC has criticised me because I said... Um, the government makes it impossible for people to have onshore wind, even if the locality wants it. Now, uh, that, um, uh, that was criticised because they said, the government, of course, said, well, we, we've, we've devolved planning permission to the locality. It's absolutely true. But if the locality decides they would like it, 
none of the support systems which you would you used to get and which you need to have are there. So that in effect the government has said that we're not going to have any more onshore wind and indeed ministers have, have made those points. Now I, I just have to say uh, there's a very simple issue here. If we don't have onshore wind where people want it, then the government should tell the public the cost to the taxpayer of that happening. Because if this is the cheapest way, then if you do something else, it must be more expensive, and the government needs to tell the people that part of their green taxes are unnecessary because they are politically motivated in the sense of saying they don't want onshore wind for reasons which I have always found difficult to follow. And that's even if you agree, which I do think, that it can't be forced on a locality. It's if the locality is prepared to have it. What would be much better is, is, is not that, but to, um, but, but to allow onshore wind wherever uh, the local community will accept it. And I think I've got onshore wind just up the road from me in, in, in Suffolk, hugely opposed uh, before it went up. Now it's, it's a lovely part of the, uh, of the whole picture. It's amazing how it has changed. Now it's there. But uh, I do think we have to be very frank about it, and that is... It's going to be expensive enough, it's going to be tough enough to deliver what we need to deliver, and we really must not exclude those things which are necessary, and CCS and onshore wind are too often. Thank you. Mark Ruskell. Yeah, just on, on, on the back of that, um, I'm interested in, in how you view innovation then. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about the US view that, well, you know, we'll just go and build something. But it could be said that some of your analysis around innovation is a little conservative. So you assume that by 2050, we'll still be extracting the same level of oil and gas, um, that we'll still have about 28% of fossil generation in our, in our electricity mix. We've seen a huge amount of innovation around renewables just in the last 10 to 15 years. The whole system is changing. Do these, are these assumptions that, that, that you make in your analyses, particularly the 2050 target, are they not a little conservative on, on innovation? Could we actually be going a lot farther, a lot quicker, if we factor in the kind of system change that are needed? Well, I'm not sure I'd agree with the detailed uh, assessment of what our assumptions are, but don't let's go through those in detail, because otherwise we might start arguing about, about what, we, what will not get us anywhere. But let, let's assume for a moment that um, you think we are uh, conservative in that. I mean, I am a passionate supporter of innovation and believe that um, innovation will make a, a very, very major contribution to our ability to meet these um, uh, our requirements. I'm also always worried about assuming that innovation will deliver and that being used as an excuse for not making the changes in what we have while we've got it. I mean, I think it really is important not to assume these things, partly because um, it's a jolly good excuse to getting out of doing what you ought to be doing, and partly also because we haven't been all that good at, at timing uh, innovation. I mean, offshore wind has actually moved much faster than we thought it would. Uh, we've been entirely wrong in uh, how much, um, for example... Um, earth source or, uh, or air source uh, um, heat pumps would be playing a part. We found it much more difficult to involve that. So I just think you just try to get the balance right. Um, and I'd be very happy to talk afterwards or some stage about things you think we have got wrong, but all the time you're trying to get that balance right. And after all, we're not saying quite that about um, uh, fossil fuel generation. We're saying that um, uh, without, if, without um, carbon capture and storage, we'll have to get all gas off the generation uh, load by somewhere in the middle of the, thir of the 2030s. Um, and that's a pretty tough statement. And so when we're talking, for example, about whether fracking is acceptable or not, we made it absolutely clear it was only acceptable if you did not create 
a, um, an infrastructure which meant that there was a reason for keeping it on the grid and on the um, uh, uh, generation thing after the dates that we had laid down. So, I mean, I, I hope we've been as, as, as in favour of innovation as you can be without um, distorting what we have to do now. Because, after all, if we have to do more than we really need, it turns out, when innovation comes, then we can move faster when that innovation comes. If we do less than we need, because we've overestimated how quickly innovation will arise, then we've got a mess. And I prefer to be on the, um, on the first trajectory. Angus MacDonald. OK, um, thanks, Convener. If we could go back, uh, Lord Devon, to the, the, the net zero and 90% targets uh, and the, the two options, uh, one and two. Um, you'll recall that in the March, 27, uh, March 2017 advice, uh, the CCC said a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of 90% would require strong progress in every sector and is at the limit of the pathways currently identified to reduce uh, Scottish emissions. Uh, by adopting a more ambitious 2050 target than currently exists for Scotland or for the UK as a whole, it would be important to identify the areas in which Scotland will go further than the rest of the UK." End quote. Um, so has the CCC identified the areas where Scotland will go further than the rest of the UK? And would you say part of the CCC's caution about suggesting a net zero target now uh, is because progress has not been made in some sectors? Well, I don't think the caution is for that reason. Um, it's much for the wider region, but we really do have to explain to people that this is not an easy thing to do and that it is not a sensible thing to espouse a target without being very clear as to what that really means, because otherwise you may as well not... Otherwise, we can have any target. I mean, any old target works if if you don't come down to terms of how you get there. And, and that seems to me to be the reason, the really fundamental reason for doing that. Now, I'm extremely gratified that uh, Scotland has wished to go to a point which we have said is at the edge of uh, what they can do, given the range of policies which they have adumbrated. I'm very pleased by that, because I think actually we're all going to have to do that, and I think Scotland is setting an example in the United Kingdom, and I think I annoy people quite a lot by reminding them that Scotland is doing much better than they are, and very good for them it is. So I'm, all, I'm very happy about that. What we now have to do is to help the government. I don't think it's for us to lay down the precise details. We know that it, although it's at the edge that you can do it, what we have to do is to help the government to see what policy changes are really necessary if they're going to deliver what, what they need to do. And that's why we have emphasised the role of agriculture, we've emphasised the role of transport, uh, and there's a huge amount that has to be done in those areas and can be done, but needs to be done now if these targets are going to be real. Um, and it's always easier to advise than to deliver. It's like it's always easier to be green in opposition <laughs> because you don't actually have to do the things that you have to do at the time you have to do it. So our job is to try to help you uh, deliver what you have done, uh, have set, and particularly now that you've set such a tough target. OK, thanks. If, if I could um, stick with uh, agriculture for, for a second. Um, under the option two scenario, the CCC's advice uh, notes that a 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in 2050 does so by reducing CO2, CO2 emissions by uh, or to around zero, uh, with the residual net positive emissions comprising non-CO2 greenhouse gases, primarily methane uh, and nitrous oxide from farming. Um, so I apologise for uh, bringing the committee back to agriculture. Uh, however, um, the CCC has consistently stated that agriculture needs to do more, uh, as, we, as we all know. Um, now, if, if more ambitious reductions were realised in the agricultural sector, would it be possible to recommend that a net zero target 
be set now? Um, I do not, with the knowledge that I have at the moment, believe that a net zero target would be possible unless agriculture plays an important part in reaching it. That I, I'm, I can't conceive of a way of doing it which would exclude what needs to be done by agriculture, because agriculture is such an important part of, of the emissions. Um, and it does seem to me that actually agriculture has a, both a positive and a negative uh, area here, negative in the sense that it has to reduce its emissions, and positive because uh, when we think of forestry and we think of ways of, of, of using the land and the improvement in, in fertility, which was the point that I talked with uh, Mr. Carson about, that, that, though, that those things are in themselves positive. If we get better fertility, we get better uh, sequestration. If we grow more trees, particularly in the right places, we not only get more sequestration, but we also do something about the immediate uh, uh, adaptation for flooding and the like. So there are all those things, but certainly agriculture has to play a part, otherwise we can't deliver. And as you've um, covered earlier uh, in the session, uh, they need as much help as they can get to, to do that. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, a, a number of the points I was going to raise have been answered, so I won't um, uh, reiterate those uh, now. Um, could, could I ask you, in terms of the interim targets, uh, if there are scenarios in which, um, and you have highlighted you still have work to do, and I appreciate that, but are there, um, uh, are there scenarios which will require changes to those interim targets? And um, could you give us a bit more detail now? Uh, about the practical implications. I mean, I highlighted in the first um, uh, session today about um, the 1.5 report, um, the IPCC warning of the need for, I quote, rapid far-reaching um, change uh, to, to stay within Paris. And I wonder, really, if you could explore with us a little bit more the interim targets. Well, uh, first of all, that uh, the government of the United Kingdom has got to take on board the fact that the interim targets, i.e. the fourth and fifth carbon budgets, have been written on the basis that they will be met from our own action and not by carrying over banked arrangements from the past. So the first thing that is absolutely clear is that that can't be done, because if you do that, then we would have to change the targets, because the targets were written on the basis that we were going to do it from our own um, uh, domestic abilities. And the reason that that was so, because that was what the government had in fact said previously, that that's what it did, and that's why it didn't bank the uh, over um, uh, uh, performance between the first and second tar uh, carbon budget. So the first thing one has to say is that there can be no question of going back on that or we won't be able to do what we have said we need to do. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, any kind of dependency on being able to buy from outside, in any case, um, credits, really do have to be only thought of in terms of emergency. In other words, you could imagine circumstances where for a short period of time you needed to do that. But you can't put that into your program, partly because it undermines the system in any case, but more importantly, because any assessment suggests that that will be a very expensive way forward. Because if all the countries in the world have signed up to Paris, even if some of them uh, don't achieve what they say they will, uh, the, there won't be a lot of free um, freebies around to buy. There'll be a lot of people wanting to buy, and therefore the competition is going to be considerable, and the price will inevitably rise. So it is bad husbandry to think that you can depend on, on that. So that is another part. And thirdly, I think, uh, although we will have to confirm this, 
I think that I'm able to stand by what we said in our initial work, which was a short piece of work, so we could only do what we could do in that sense. I think we'll be able to say that we can actually not, uh, we, we need not alter the targets for the fourth and fifth carbon budget, as long as what we accept is that we have to perform at the top end of the uh, uh, expectation rather than lower down. Because like all these things, you have a kind of um, V-shape of, uh, of the possible outcomes of what you're doing, uh, that one being uh, rather less reduction from that one. Clearly, we've got to get to that end and not that end. Um, and so that will, that, that will, that will produce uh, not a new target, but a different way of looking at that target, recognising that you really have to hit it at the top end and not anywhere lower. And then that gets the trajectory in the right direction. And could, could I ask you also about whether, in your view, the sectors which um, your committee are specifically to offer advice on energy efficiency and generation, land use and transport, as I understand it, are sufficient to give a complete view. And does a requirement to offer advice on contributions to be made by sectors of the Scottish economy offer adequate scope to cover all relevant emitters? I think at the moment, yes. Um, but it's something we keep a very close eye on and I think the committee can be assured that if we felt that the advice that we were giving was not complete or not uh, as accurate as we would want it to be, we would ask to be able to give advice or indeed give you advice. Because again, the, the Act is sufficiently uh, open to allow us to decide for ourselves that we really feel we ought to give advice on something which we have not done so before because we saw that to be happening. I mean, let me give you an example. We, we, there is no um, uh, statutory requirement to give advice on bitcoins. But the energy use of bitcoins is very, very considerable. And you could imagine circumstances where that... But then when the, when the Act was written, bitcoins didn't, uh, didn't occur. I just take it as an, a small example. But we would, we would not feel that we shouldn't give advice just simply because that wasn't, didn't seem to fit under any of the other um, areas we were supposed to be dealing with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Um, yes, the, the, we're, we're on target to go ahead of the 56% uh, target. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, but, well, I, I know why I was getting confused uh, for a second there. Uh, the target setting criteria, have, has the committee had any input to, to that in itself? I'm sorry, I'm not really sure of what you mean by that. Don't... Well, the, 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 you provide the scientific advice, but the government makes choices and takes your advice. Uh, but in deciding um, what targets it's going to set based on your advice, is there a feedback loop that means the government's checking with you what it's doing before it decides? Well, pr primary, of course, we. We set the primary target. The government then, as you rightly say, decides how it's going to reach that primary target and may set subsidiary targets, saying this or that or the other must reach this because that will add up. In our annual report, which we have by law to produce every June, we are constantly looking at that and seeing whether it is a, a being met B, is it feasible for it to be met? And C, should there be a different way of doing it? So, yes. And, of course, there are internal discussions um, that one has when you begin to question some of these things because we have a wider range, perhaps, of, of uh, scientific tentacles and technological tentacles than, than the government will naturally have. So there will be that ongoing position. But every June we assess that and then they have to answer before the end of October. So they have just produced their uh, October answer to our pretty tough statement in June. Um, it, it frankly doesn't go far enough. We 
we will be making this point very clearly, uh, they have a lot more to do. And one of our problems is that we see in this government a government that wants to do it, uh, so we don't have the problem of trying to deal with somebody who doesn't want to deliver, but what we have to do is to keep the feet to the fire, because as, again, Jim Ski says, the, every bit, to quote Tesco's, every little bit helps. You've actually got, you've got to get it on its way, and every extra bit we do this year really uh, will make a big difference next year and the year afterwards. And we've got these 12 years. It's a, as the IP, P, IPCC report says, there is a very crucial period now, which if we don't get this in line, um, we will find it incredibly difficult to get back on track. It be many a mickle, mack a muckle. It might be, but I would hesitate as a non-stop to but, quote but something like in, that. In, in, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, but the fi final point, which I think has come up to some extent, is should we be um, disaggregating the overall targets to, to help agriculture and transport get tighter focus on the things they need to do? Well, I think we should be um, making clear to the sectors what they're supposed to do, and in that sense it requires a certain disaggregation of the, the targets. And the point that uh, uh, Finlay Carson raised, which I think is important to remind us, is that it is true about the whole United Kingdom that our overall success in uh, decarbonisation of the electricity supply has tended to hide our overall failures in improving in uh, uh, agriculture and uh, transport, and indeed in home heating. Um, and uh, therefore setting disaggregated targets. But I also think we need to be very much tougher on obvious examples of nonsense. And now one of the things I really wish Scotland would do would be to set standards for house building which were sensible standards instead of the ones that we've got at the moment which aren't sensible. Devolution gives you enormous ability to do something of this sort. And if you did to house builders what should be done in, throughout the whole of the United Kingdom and said, I'm sorry, if you want to build a house, you cannot build it on the basis that it's got to be retrofitted later. It's actually got to be built more or less to passive house standards. And if you did that, you would find that that does not increase the cost of the house in any real sense because in so far as it is more expensive, that will be reduced by the um, fact that it will become uh, mass production and not niche production. And it will also be reduced because the cost goes into the cost of the land. It actually lowers the price of land because that's how the price of land is fixed. And so for me, there are individual real issues that are not about sectors as much as about activities. And one of the things, surely, as we should be saying, is that no house is built today which is going to make our problem more difficult in 20 years' time. I mean, that seems to me obvious. So how have we got ourselves into a position in which I actually have to argue this everywhere? And I have enough faith in the Scots to believe that you could force the rest of the United Kingdom to do it by doing it yourself first. And you won't have one house less, less built. But Mr Persimmon may not be entirely happy. <laughs> a mere 50 million bonus next year rather than the 75 million this year. Yeah. Mm. Richard Lyle has a supplementary. Can I, uh, Lord Nevin, I agree with you entirely. I'm pushing in this Parliament for houses to be built with solar panels on the roofs more than, than, than they already provide. We have, in my son's house, they only have two panels, where the next door neighbour has now put on an extra 10. Um, and yeah, and also, and also that um, basically we should have houses being built now with electric charging points for electric cars, rather than as cluttering the streets with all these different things. Or even let's mention, since you've mentioned Tesco, let's mention ASDA putting in the electric charging points.
Would you agree that, that houses should be built to that standard? And I think you do. Well, I try to use a slightly vague title because there are various ways of doing it. But roughly speaking, the passive house standard, the sort of standard which um, Hasto Housing Association has now reached for what it does, uh, which it can do within the present situation, is the sort of standard we should be doing. It. We should be looking at all the things that stop it. I mean, there are technical issues about uh, about um, rents, for example. If you if you reduce somebody's energy bill dramatically, which you can do by this sort of growth, there's no reason why you the local uh, housing association or the local authority can't share some of that reduction to put that into the extra cost, if there is to start with an extra cost of building. There's, there are ways in which this can be done, and the, the law ought to be uh, changed in order to encourage that rather than made to be almost impossible to, to uh, encourage it. I think there are a whole series of institutional things that can be done which would make a huge difference. Because if over the United Kingdom we are seeking to build 300,000 houses a year, the idea of adding 300,000 to the houses we've already got, which don't come up to standards, it just seems to me, frankly, balmy. Thank you. I'm listening to that discussion and I'm, I'm thinking that a net zero carbon target is, is potentially achievable, but... <coughs> How do you define achievable? What's, what's the key test, then? It seems like we've got lots of policy prescriptions that are possible, different pathways. What's the point? What's the, the key test where you say this is now achievable? Uh, well, there is, of course, always a degree of judgment in that. What we seek to do is to say... Is this within a possible financial uh, ability? In other words, is this something which, if we really put our mind to it, we could afford? Is the technology there to do it? Or is it likely that it will be there to do it? Or is there a way of bringing that technology forward so that it can do it? That might do the talking about carbon capture and storage. Can we put together um, a succession of scenarios over the years which clearly are credible to people and do not demand uh, leaps in the dark about which you have no real answer? I think that's the, the kind of picture that we have. Um, could I stand up and defend the scenarios and go through them in detail with someone without there being some hole which they are able to say, well, how on earth are you going to bridge that? Uh, that's a question I ask myself. That's one of the things I'm very determined to be able to do. I think that's all that one can do about achievable. It, it's, it's saying that taking everything into account, this is by no means impossible, but it's hard. And that's what it should be, because we've got a big job to do. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thank you. Um, uh, emission accounting. Um, the CCC recommended the overall accounting framework should shift from one based, which shift to one based on actual emissions rather than uh, net accounting. Now you, you've covered it somewhat, but could you could you tell us, other than uh, the obvious uh, more transparency, uh, what the advantages and disadvantages of accounting for uh, rather than uh, in looking at net emissions? Well, the first thing is transparency. I listened with great uh, care and interest to the person who answered your questions earlier on on this. And, and he was, for example, talking about the annual uh, uh, system in, in Scotland as against the five yearly one that we have over the United Kingdom as a whole. And I understand precisely what he meant about um, uh, having an annual discussion in Parliament and it being at the head, therefore, of the political agenda. Uh, my problem with it, and I admit it, is that I think it's... I think one of our difficulties is to give people a target which they can hang on to and doesn't constantly change. 
and our, the fundamental reason for doing what we suggested was that it did give coherence and consistency and I think comprehensibility to the target in a way which um, the, the previous and alternative ways would not do it. It really is. What do, you, what do you want a target for? You want it to do two things. One, one, you want it actually to make people reduce their emissions. That's one thing. And the other thing is you want to make it possible for people to recognise that and see what they're trying to do. And this is difficult because um, so many things alter it. And if, you've all, if in any case you've got to explain that in a year where, the, where you have a brutal winter, your targets are not going to be as easy to meet. And similarly, you mustn't get too excited if you've had the most wonderful winter where you haven't used any heating at all. I think that's difficult enough. And so our attempt was to give you a system which was as accurate as it could be, but, but really didn't confuse. I should have earlier declared an interest as being a former farmer and a member of the NFUS. But on the back of that, do you think we need additional policy measures for, for sectors to get the credit for what they're doing. So, for example, you know, uh, negative emissions are going to be really important to achieve 90% or net zero. Um, and, I, and I think farmers and land uh, managers are going to play a, a large part or can contribute a large part to uh, negative emissions. So do we need more policy measures to, to encourage that by giving those sectors, whether it's transport or agriculture or forestry, give them the credit for the, the, the benefits they're bringing? Well, I, I, I'm a great believer in gratitude. Um, it seems to me that uh, saying thank you and, and recognising is more like people are more likely to go on doing it than, than just beating about the ears when they don't do it. And so instinctively, I'm believer in that, and particularly as in Scotland, uh, peat restoration, for example, is a, a crucial part of, of what we have to do. Uh, forestry, which we've not been successful, really, in meeting our targets in any part of the United Kingdom, and it's a really important part of it. Um, and as we have said before, re recreating the fertility in soil where soils have been become less fertile, all those things... Um, require real effort and, and I think measuring it is important to make sure it happens and isn't just anecdotal but it's also important to be able in fact to recognise it. Now whether that means you pay people money or whether it means that you, you find some other way of, of recompense or whatever your policy may be that's really for the government, the Scottish government but I'm quite sure it's important to, to make people feel that when they've done things it's recognised, understood, and they get credit for it. Finally, convener. Um, uh, oh. OK, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, articulate the advantages and disadvantages of setting annual targets contained in the Climate Bill rather than the multi-year carbon budgets contained in the UK Climate Change Act. Well, annual targets obviously concentrate the mind on a regular basis, ensure that, politically speaking, um, people can't forget about them for very long because they're going to come up again. So, I mean, there is, there's an obvious advantage. Um, for me, the disadvantage, and I've said this publicly before, for me, the disadvantage is that annually the target is so affected by um, the weather, um, by the closure of one particular uh, installation, by um, some slight change in the inventory. All those things can make a huge difference on an annual target, but if spread over five years, make comparisons uh, that much easier and, and, and confuse people less. The trouble with annual targets, I think, is fundamentally is that every year you've got to explain them. Now, that means it is a proper debate in Parliament and the rest of it, so there's a plus there. The minus is that every year you have to do that, and every year there will be some lot of people who say, well, it's, no, you're just excusing it. No, no, you know, you could have done better. No. 
So it actually wearies ministers who are doing their, you know, when ministers are doing their best, I think it's quite hard. When you've really done your best, you've, ach you've achieved un in an underlying way something really worthwhile, and you have to announce you haven't, hit, you haven't hit the targets, which is what Scotland's had to do year after year, and that's not very helpful. So I think those are the balances. But Scotland has made a choice, and we, we try to work with that choice to make it um, as effective as it can be. OK. Uh, thanks. And just looking at uh, Section 15, which uh, alters existing uh, emissions accounting, mm -hmm. uh, will these uh, proposed changes to emissions accounting reduce the level of risk that could be attached to inventory revisions in terms of the accuracy of targets? Well, it won't eliminate it. Let's, let's put that clearly. What we advised was to... Was, was the best system we thought to reduce the arbitrary effects of recalibration, of new information, of bringing into the system things that were out of it before. Pete, for example, is a very good example of that. So we're trying to have the way that that, 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 that would be least distorting because the targets do have this role of, um, of encouraging people to reach it, of making people see that that's the aim, and if you move the goalposts, that has a, a, a damaging effect. So we just went through the various possibilities and tried to choose the one which most gave accuracy and consistency, but it won't do both all the time. That's the nature of life. Thank you. We have a final question from Mark Rusko on the financial memorandum. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think your advice last year stated that you hadn't done um, a costing on the 90% target. Just wondering what the barriers are to that, and whether you will be conducting a study on that target or indeed any other target that Parliament should decide on. Well, um, in doing the work that we have been uh, uh, asked to do, we will, of course, have to do a whole lot of scenario planning to show that what we are proposing is, to come back to your own question, is attainable. Um, and in doing that, we will be putting costings on it, because you have to show that to make them sensible. In the context of that, the 90 uh, degree, uh, the 90% reduction, uh, it will become clearer and clearer that because they are to some extent, in fact not to all extent, the same policies you've got to do to do that, only more so, um, we will be putting costs which will be, I hope, of use to the um, uh, to Parliament and, and to the Government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you for, for giving the evidence. Maybe give you an opportunity for anything else that you'd like to say in relation to the climate change bill that you feel you haven't had, but you have just <laughs> given 90 minutes of evidence. So well, you've been very kind. Horrible. No, I, the only thing I, I want to say is, is this is a, I mean, I just want us all to be absolutely clear in our minds that what we're doing is, is really important, that there isn't anything else that could be as important in a material sense, uh, but helping people to solve this problem. And I just leave you with this, this thought. My, my son wrote a book um, on the Black Death. It's become the standard book on the Black Death. And as any of you know, if you have a son writing a book, as each chapter comes off the machine, you, you're expected to read it. And um, I was busy reading it at the same time as doing some fundamental work on, on climate change. And what struck me was this really frightening thing that one in three of the population died in the Black Death, but they had no idea as to why. So they had no responsibility, because they didn't know. Our problem is that we do know, and therefore we have absolute responsibility. Not only have we caused it, but we know how to stop it, at least to pull it back and then finally to reverse it. We know that. And the responsibility is ours. And I just think all of us should recognise what a high calling 
we have. We have to do it. Well, thank you very much. That's an excellent note to end on. I want to thank you, thank for, you. For, again for coming and giving evidence, and I'll suspend this meeting for two minutes.
The second item on the agenda for the committee to consider is the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016, the Register of Persons Holding a Controlled Interest in Land Scotland Regulations 2021 draft. I would like to welcome the Cabinet Secretary and her officials to the committee, Pauline Davison, Head of Land Reform Policy Team for the Scottish Government, Andrew Ruxton, Scottish Di Government Legal Directorate, and Dr Simon Cuthbert Kerr, the Head of the Land Reform Unit. Welcome to you all. Um, I will start off by asking the Cabinet Secretary if we can have an update on the development and integration of the 20 registers on the Scotland's Land Information Service. Um, I think the most uh, Im important thing for my interests uh, is the ones that are most directly related to uh, the whole uh, land reform issue. Um, my understanding um, is that Scotless isn't going to be providing access to all 20 registers, um, but what it, what it will include is the land register and the Sazine register, which are already available uh, through Scotless. Um, and there's a crofting register that's also been introduced. Um, also available for access is the register of inhibitions, the register of deeds and the register of judgments uh, will be um, available imminently. Um, and obviously uh, the register of persons holding a controlled interest, this particular one, um, will also be available through Scotless when it goes live. Um, and the registers currently planning how best to do that. What work has been done to publicise um, Scotless and to ensure that citizens are aware, aware of the availability of all this information? Um, well, uh, the officials are currently working pretty closely with the registers of Scotland, as you could imagine, um, and there is an awareness raising exercise planned uh, um, before it becomes operational, before this register, this new register becomes operational. Um, and obviously that's to ensure people are aware of the information that's going to be available in the register, but it would also be to ensure that those people who ought to be registering are registering as well. So the awareness raising um, uh, covers both, uh, will cover both sides of that, um, but will happen um, a little bit closer to the point at which the register is going to become live, um, which we expect to be in 2021. I'm not sure doing an awareness raising exercise this far out would be particularly helpful. I suspect people would have forgotten by the time it, it came around. So the idea is to push it towards the point at which the register becomes live. Okay, thank you for that. Alec Rowley. Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask, the, when we were taking evidence, a number of different uh, organisations talked about the difficulties in being able to access information on the register. They described it as potentially onerous. Um, can I ask what work has been carried out or is planned to develop a user guide uh, and will stakeholders be involved in such a development? Well, well stakeholders um, have already, uh, officials have already been working closely with stakeholders in, in actually developing the regulations up to this point. Um, and they are going to continue to do that, um, both for uh, the revised regulations as we go through this process, um, but also in respect of guidance, which is my intention to have uh, um, published, so that when the regulations come into force, there is guidance for users uh, um, also available at the same time. Uh, and that's work which is currently being uh, undertaken um, um, that, that conversation between officials and stakeholders is, is continuing and will continue uh, up until uh, that point. Um, we'll also be working with the registers of Scotland in respect of uh, their end of things because they will themselves carry out user testing with stakeholders uh, and those stakeholders will be um, customers, potential, potential users of the register. Um, uh, about access and using um, the system as simply as possible. So there will be guidance for those who are trying to navigate their way through the system, as there will be help for those who have to register as well. Uh, and again, that will be ready for the point at which the register goes live. And do you have a timetable for finalising lane and commencement of the regulations uh, and the publication of the guide? Um, well, the expectation is the register will go live in 2021. 
Um, we're not under enormous time pressure as a result of that. So our consultation doesn't actually close for another couple of weeks. Um, we will be uh, considering the results of that consultation. Um, th this is not a procedure which I'm hugely familiar with myself. It's a kind of unusual uh, sort of procedure because at the point uh, uh, when we've analysed the consultation, we come back and there will be draft revised kind of SI yeah. um, uh, um, published and will no doubt be back at the committee um, and you will be able to see what changes, if any, have been made as a result of uh, the consultation exercise, but that still is um, in draft form. Uh, and we, we're working roughly on a basis of autumn next year for that, I think is a fair enough kind of um, estimate. So at, at some point a year from now, that draft revised SI will be available for the committee's perusal. Um, and our expectation is that the actual SI um, the, the bit of the process we're much more familiar with would happen um, uh, in the early new year following that. So we would be talking about early 2020. But of course, the expectation is the register isn't actually going to go live until 2021. So there is, there is quite an extended timescale for all of this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, now have a number of members want to ask questions around the recording of address. I'll start with Richard Lyle. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, certain sections of society can ask for their home address to be withheld for security reasons, i.e. candidates standing for election as an MP or people who are on the electoral roll. And also there is uh, the laws covering data protection information uh, being withheld. So what is your view in regard to a recorded person's name and address um, what does that mean in practice? And do you agree with the keeper that it does not matter if it is a service or residential address? And would an email address be appropriate or not? Um, well, if I can just take the, the, the last bit first. I, I, I'm not sure that I agree that an email address is appropriate. I, I, I don't think, I mean, I understand why people think that's an easy option, but we've probably all got experience personal experience of having any number of potential email addresses, many of which we've forgotten or they're sitting there unused or defunct and that we never check. Um, so I think there's, a, there's some issues around email addresses that make an email address as being the sole way of doing it um, not particularly uh, useful. I, I do think some form of physical address is, is preferable. Um, uh, and uh, because it's a kind of physical, real-world uh, address, and it does give us more certainty that notification um, has, has been achieved, whereas an email address might not, because if people are not checking their email, I don't know that that would necessarily be particularly helpful. Um, I think from the, the, as I understand it, from the Keeper's evidence, um, uh, there are pros and cons in respect of a service versus a, a service address versus a residential address. Uh, and I, I suppose it's really just a balance um, uh, between the two if you're talking about people's residential as opposed to uh, a kind of official address. Um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, that there's obviously still a, a conversation in and around that um, but I do agree with uh, the Register that the physical address is preferable. So there's perhaps a bit of a conversation around how a service address might work as opposed to a residential address. Um, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't think that that should push us into an email response, an email address, because I don't think that's appropriate. So what about a, a lawyer's address or um, a... Co we all agree that we need a contact address, yes. but we have a problem where there may be someone may be fleeing violence from an abusive husband or partner or whatever, and they own a property, and that address has to be kept um, safe in order for them to be safe. So, and there also is the, the point that the keeper will have the discretion on whether, uh, I may be saying into somebody else's question, but has a, 
the discretion of um, keeping, you know, of deciding who who she will allow and who she won't allow. Would you agree that, you know, a, a lawyer's address or a business address would be preferable to a person's personal address? Um, That's all I'm asking. Yeah, I, th I mean, obviously that it would be a pro. I mean, I, I talked about there being pros and cons, I think, about some of this, because that would be um, a, a, an argument in favour of a business address or a service address. Um, and I, I think the most obvious one that we would all think about is a lawyer's office. Um, uh, that wouldn't be an unusual um, concept. Um, uh, but, it, of course, it could allow a person to spread their interests across numerous addresses. So th there are just some issues that would need to be unpacked um, if we went to that. Um, uh, so... Um, so I think that there are there are still some issues in and around that that probably need to be kind of thought about quite carefully. Um, it may be that I mean I, I don't know. It may be that if if a person uses a service address, that we would expect them to use that same service address for everything, rather than um, you know rather than start using different service addresses for different um, for different properties. So it's really just a um, it, it's it's just managing that. Um, because this is meant to be, uh, obviously, um, a register that makes ownership more transparent. So, so we've, we're kind of trying to keep that balance um, uh, reasonable. Um, so, you know, there, there are just still some issues to be bottomed out there. So you haven't made up your mind yet? Well, you know, I'm, I'm looking at all the evidence. The consultation's not closed. Um, you've asked me to come and give evidence at a period where... At the moment, the consultation is still ongoing. I'm presuming that's because you want to be part of the consultation. So uh, I need to have a look and see uh, what some of the responses to that will be. Um, and I, I don't want to terrify the officials by making policy up on the hoof here without discussing it with them. But, you know, one way to manage the service address issue might be to insist that it be a single service address that's used for a multiplicity of registrations rather than trying to have one set of solicitors doing one and I mean the other group of people that one could see being used quite often might be an accountant's address so you don't want you know we don't want to be in a position of a land agent or a you know you could you could imagine how many potential service addresses there might be if if we just opened it up like that so I think there are still some issues that need to be kind of thought about. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Thank you and good morning, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary, and I myself. Um, just to explore those issues um, in a little bit more detail, um, would you agree that there could be a risk that by not recording a home or permanent address, it might be easier for the recorded person to avoid identification? Um, I'll give you an example of um, an absentee land uh, lord who might only visit um, a, a couple of times a year uh, or, or not even that. And would it be acceptable, in your view, to record um, an address um, here in Scotland for that person, where they can be contacted? Um, well, as you know, as I understand the position, is people are going to be able to search the register by a person's name and date of birth. Um, uh, so that, in a sense, helps get round that um, issue, because then you would be able to see the various different controlling interests and uh, any single associate may hold. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of one uh, side, of, uh, side of it. In terms of, I think, what were you talking about? A recorded... Sorry, what was the... the, 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 the to, to have to have a, an address within Scotland. Um, I don't know... Where they can be contacted. We... we, we um, I don't know whether or not we're currently, what the current position is with that in terms of the consultation. Um, I think... Um, so just to highlight the, mm -hmm. the, the issue of absenteeism and, and um, the transparency of ownership um, within the context of this... Mm -hmm. um, of this yeah, um, I, I mean, this, the, the, the difficulty of this is trying to trying to think through all the potential implications of what, yes. what, what it might mean. Mm, and, mm. I mean, clearly this is really about those who own land in Scotland, regardless of where they yes. actually live. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think that the, as far as the, the recorded person who is the person who's 
providing the information about mm -hmm. um, their their associates, mm -hmm. they will be they should be on the land register in some way or form because they are actually registered as the owner. Mm -hmm. What the red what this register is trying to do is capture people who don't appear on the land register. So it's really mm -hmm. the yeah the sort of associates who are trying to catch. And I, again, I think as the cabinet secretary said, it's 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 about trying to find the balance in terms of what is appropriate to find the, the right address for that that type of person who may not be there or not. So no, that's helpful. And um, uh, I wonder, I just would like to also highlight for you, Cabinet Secretary, the issue of um, commercial confidentiality, which we've received different um, views on. But the Keeper did say in giving evidence to us that she did not think that the commercial confidentiality was a justification for exemption. And I wonder if you have any comment. Um, on that. I would be inclined to agree with that. Uh, I, I don't know how commercially confidential actual ownership should be. Um, you know, there might be issues of detail of management that are commercially confidential, but I'd be struggling to see how there's anything commercially confidential about the, the physical act of ownership in that sense. Thank you. Which and finally, just to how the sorry, that's minus, probably that's yeah. probably what the register, you know, the, the, the register means. Yeah. yeah yes. the, the register won't disclose things such as a, a um, financial status or anything like that. It's it's just sure. basically name details. That's that's what yeah, it disclose. I, I think we need to remember that the, I mean, the the the, the register is really uh, coming directly off the back of the explicit. Um, mm -hmm. uh, clauses in the land reform legislation. Yes. So we can't, we're not, in any case, we're not really going to be able to go beyond yes. that. Yes. So yes. that would, I suspect, kind of already protect some issues about commercial confidentiality. Right, thank you. And just uh, finally, from my perspective, to go back to the security declaration, there's been the suggestion um, in terms of um, the appropriate degree of anonymity and protection for those who, who um, could be regarded as at risk, mm. that it might be that the use of a unique reference number could be considered. And I wonder if you had any thoughts on that at this stage. I mean, other than that it's part and parcel of that, trying to decide on the pros and cons of various approaches to ensure that we capture the maximum amount of information that it's expected that this register would capture without the consequences for some individuals being so adverse as to be perverse. Um, and, and it is about maintaining that balance. So, um, yes, th these are all things that we would want to keep in under consideration. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, um, Convener. With regard to uh, Part 3, uh, duties to provide information, you mentioned a Cabinet Secretary a awareness raising in your opening remarks, and, and clearly significant publicity will be imperative in the run-up to the register going live to, to ensure compliance. Um, when the Keeper gave evidence to the committee, she mentioned the possibility that someone could um, still inadvertently fail to comply through ignorance of the rules. Um, so do you agree with the Keeper who said that there should be a grace period uh, to allow for inadvertent non-compliance uh, to be rectified? Uh, and if you do agree, um, how long should that uh, grace period be? Um, I don't think a grace period um, is, is something that we could really argue against. A grace period isn't unusual. Um, there are other circumstances, I think, in which this similar kind of uh, um, uh, approach is taken, and I think it would be reasonable in this case. We, you know, there's obviously a big awareness-raising exercise to be, um, uh, to be undertaken, um, and there may be people who just it doesn't dawn on them that they are people for whom this register is appropriate. Um, so there will be, uh, in some cases, I suspect, people who genuinely have made a mistake. Um, and I don't want to be in the business, I don't think anybody would want to be in the business of hounding people where it was a genuine mistake with no real, uh, you know, obvious intent to, uh, uh, to try and fly under the radar. Um, and I think, uh, if I'm right, the Keeper did say that, that what she would do in those circumstances if they if they came across people in 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 that way that she would she would write and remind and there would be a a prodding from uh, uh from the keeper <coughs> themselves and that allows them to rectify it before any criminal proceedings uh, are taken so um we'll we'll work closely with the keeper on that although i don't think we can have an open-ended time scale 
Um, I think whatever the time scale, the, the grace period time scale is, that you would want it to be quite clear. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, whether that was six months or around that period, you know, I suppose is something we can have a further discussion about. But I think it should be a time limited grace period. It shouldn't be allowed to go on. And if the if the awareness raising exercise in the run up to the register going live is successful, we really should have gotten it down to only a very small number of people who might accidentally, inadvertently or whatever, um, fail to fail to comply when they should. Um, uh, but I, I, I mean, the current proposition of six months feels about right to me. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, since we're already raising awareness of our plans for this register, we're hoping by the point it actually goes live that we don't have many folk who are un unaware of it. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Billy Carson. Thank you. I, I've got uh, two questions that are, are, are linked. You know, there's a duty to provide the information, um, and, and the keeper can do some level of uh, validation with regards to addresses that are put in. So it, it could be postcodes and whether that postcode exists or, or correct date of births, whatever. But what is, is less easy to do is actually to, to, to verify the information to find out whether it's a false address or a valid address. Uh, incorrect date of birth. Um, but the, the regulations are clear that the legal responsibility lies with the, the person who's registering. What guidance and training will be given to uh, the police who will ultimately be enforcing these regulations? Um, well, I'm sure the police are going to be delighted to be advised of uh, uh, um, the purpose of the regulations, what constitutes non-compliance, and uh, officials um, are already in contact with Police Scotland and with the Crown Office um, in respect of this, uh, so that the police are involved in early stage uh, and, and understand the process uh, themselves. So we will continue to work with them as the regulations uh, are developed further. And I, I, I kind of said in answer to an early question that we are consulting on and we will continue to talk to um, stakeholders about guidance. Um, and that obviously will include the police and, and the Crown Office. Um, and uh, uh, there is a job to be done there, but there is time. The, this process gives us the kind of time uh, uh, to do that. Um, and by the time this is going live, um, we would anticipate that the police were at least, you know, well aware of what was and was not required um, and what their responsibilities were. And I would like to jump back to... Uh looking at addresses and, and whether it's a home address or an agent's address or whatever, but also your comments on an email. I, I wonder whether it's not very forward looking to exclude the possibility of identifying or verifying an individual using an email address, because there's, there's many methods to, to verify an individual uh, using uh, links and whatever. And, and there is a legal responsibility to provide a uh, a valid, valid information. So there'd be no point in me providing Mickey Mouse at Scottish Parliament if that didn't actually get to me, because I wouldn't be able to verify it. So is, is there any thought being given to uh, using emails uh, with uh, to verify uh, a, a registration, and in the same way that it would be possible to record uh, to send a recorded letter to a, an agent or a home address, uh, which required a response within a set time? To, to add to the verification, to ensure that we're actually getting to the, the individual which the, the registration is applicable to? Um, well, I hear what you say about emails, but I'm still not confident that the use of an email actually gives us the, the, the kind of um, confidence that we would be looking for. Um, you know, as I indicated, people have a multiplicity of emails and some of them kind of go into disuse, um, aren't checked. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I just, I just think an email at, at this stage is not really has enough security around it to... But that to might just be, sorry to interrupt, that, that might just be to be in the public facing side of the register where, it, as Claudia Beamish mentioned, there may be some reference back to a, an actual physical address that doesn't need to be in the, the public domain. Uh, I'm just, I'm at the moment not convinced that email is the way to go forward and I know it may seem um, a bit retro but I think um, for everybody's uh, confidence just now 
I, I don't think it's, it's quite the right place to go. That's not to say that it might not in future become more so. Um, I think you talked about recorded letters. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it certainly would be possible uh, with a letter to require a response within a set period of time. With an email, you wouldn't even know if it had been had actually reached who it was meant to have reached. I mean, I, I think that's a, a, is an issue. Um, uh, um, so, um, I mean, there is an issue about validating addresses. That there is no doubt about it. But it might be extremely difficult to have that um, applied to absolutely everybody. Um, it, it could make the whole process incredibly unwieldy. So there's a certain amount um, that we will be taking on trust. Um, uh, because there isn't really any other way to do it. If we had to validate every single uh, contact address, um, then the whole cost of operating the register would probably spiral out of practical um, management. So this is all about maintaining that balance between what is appropriate and practical um, and effective. Okay. Yeah, and then we have some final questions uh, on non-compliance sections, starting with Mark Ruskell. Yes, thanks, convener. Um, I want to ask you about whether the five grand fine is an appropriate deterrent uh, for non-compliance, or is there a danger it just becomes the price of anonymity? Um, that's obviously on the assumption that everybody on this register would be um, so wealthy that 5,000, potentially a fine of 5,000 is not, for them, a huge uh, issue, but the, that's to misunderstand when when these penalties are set. This is to, to misunderstand what the what that penalty is about. And that penalty is about the nature of the crime, not the the financial interests of the person who commits it, um, which is uh, how these penalties are uh, uh, arrived at across a whole range of criminal activities. Um, the, the fine is up to 5,000. That's the normal way of expressing it. Um, uh, and it remains to be seen whether or not there are people who think it's a price well worth paying at the moment. I don't think there would be any evidence um, of that. And not to forget that it is actually a criminal um, matter and therefore uh, non-compliance. However, financially, it might not be considered a huge issue nevertheless leaves you with a criminal record. What would be the implications for a landowner then, the practical implications of having such a criminal record in, in this case? Well, it would depend on the individual owner's circumstances. I don't, I mean, I, I, you, the, that would be different depending on, on the owner and what the owner did and didn't do and, and you know, and all the rest of it. And, you know, that's... that's Sorry, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, so, so that, I mean, I, I couldn't really answer that in the absence yeah. of an actual individual criminal case yeah. and an individual accused. For some accused, that would be a, a pretty serious issue, um, regardless of, 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 the, of the matter. Mm -hmm. um, I would have expected most people don't want a criminal record anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if somebody was a, a director of a, of a company, for example, need to be a fit and proper person, all of those that things come into account. Them, yeah. for example. All of okay. those things come into account. Yeah. George Stevenson. Um, given that the prosecution would take place against a backdrop of somebody seeking to maintain their anonymity of their connection to a particular property, would the prosecution in and of itself not reveal that connection? That's a very good and question. Thus, <laughs> and thus remove the, the privacy which the individual sought. Now, and, and therefore remove any reason for them not to register. Uh, but that could, of course, be obviated if the court decided to hold the case in private, which I could imagine it might do. Well, but none, sorry, just a tiny second. But nonetheless, would you expect that the verdict of the court, if someone is found guilty, would be put on the record and thus remove the anonymity that was being sought? Well, this is not a question that I can answer for obvious reasons. Um, uh, it, I would, I would uh, you know, my feeling, and I may be wrong, and I don't know whether or not anybody wants to uh, chip in uh, from the side 
uh, from the kind of justice side of things. I, I would be um, surprised uh, if a prosecution proceeded on the basis of an an anonymity in these circumstances. I certainly would be surprised if a conviction uh, um, uh, uh, proceeded on the basis of anonymity. It may be, depending on the individual circumstances of an individual person, uh, um, there may be an argument by lawyers that, that there are reasons why anonymity should continue, but I'm not really in a, in a position to be able to answer a definitive yes or no in these circumstances, because that would be a matter probably for the court at the time. It, f finally, therefore, Minister, would the government consider uh, amending the proposals in this regard so that upon conviction, the interest is then recorded on the register whether the person concerned wishes it to happen or not? Um, that's something that we'll take uh, uh, um, uh, on board and have a think about. It's a fair point. Um, and the discussions uh, with the Crown Office particularly perhaps can be extended to include this particular aspect of things because that would, you know, th those in the normal course of events would be matters for the court at the time, um, whether or not we would be in a position to be able to, in advance, bind mm. that is, a, is a, obviously a question that we would need to have a think about. At least empower the court so yeah. to do. So, I mean, it's an interesting point, and we will take that on board. I believe that's all the questions that we have to ask. I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary and her officials for coming to give us evidence today. And I suspend this... Oh, hang on. <laughs> Next meeting, on the 24th of October, the committee will take evidence from the Minister for Rural Affairs and Natural Environment on the Scottish Government's proposal to consent to the UK Government legislating using powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to the UK statutory instrument proposals for the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme, Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018. The Committee will now move, move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you.